do not forget me. How have you seen Les Mis more times than I have? I haven't seen Les Mis more times than you have. I just remember how terrible his shit is. Do not forget me. Do not forget me. How did he get an Oscar for that? (laughs) Well, what? You won an Oscar for that? Yeah. Oh, my God. You won Best Director for that movie. What? Toby Hooper? Yeah. I thought you meant Russell Crowe. Oh, no. Jesus Christ, Max. Oh. Well, anyway, welcome to the Spectator <laughs> Film Podcast. If there is one movie Russell Crowe deserved an Oscar for, we're talking about it today. I'm Austin. And I'm Max. And today we're talking about Master and Commander. The movie everyone's talking about on the internet currently. Yes, because first off, we're we're going full Twitter vibes today. Um, even though we've been planning to do this movie before Twitter. Honestly, we were planning to do this before you guys. Okay, we full hipster. We had been planning to do this movie <laughs> yes. for months now, and then it just had to get timely for two reasons. One, the the Zoomers decided that sea shanties are the new thing. Yes, and I'm just like. Nudge, nudge. Hey, Austin, maybe we should move up Master and Commander on our list a little bit. We've been practicing for it. And yeah. It's like, eh, fuck the Zoomers. And I always say that. Fuck the Zoomers. That's Austin's catchphrase, honestly. Yeah. And then somebody on some asshole on Twitter had to be like, oh, if you want a good sleep aid during the pandemic, fucking watch Master and Commando. You'll be asleep in the first 10 minutes. Oh, that's what someone said. They weren't yeah. insulting Russell Crowe specifically. No, but they added him in the tweet. Oh. <laughs> And then Russell Crowe responded something like, oh, it's okay. It's a movie for adults. A get off my lawn comment. Yeah. Yeah. And Twitter loved that epic ponage, I guess. Yeah. So it started (laughs) trending on Twitter. You know what, though? Russell Crowe is right. That guy who is like, oh, if you want to fall asleep, fucking loser. Also, the first 10 minutes of this movie are an action scene. And it's loud. (laughs) I don't know how you'd fall asleep. I think you might have narcolepsy, my dude. Yeah. I don't know. Maybe check that out or something. If, you, if you're if you bored by this movie, maybe go see someone about that. That's my advice. But yeah, so needless to say, this is a movie that we've both been wanting to do for a long time. And then it's just synchronicity. Sometimes life comes at you and meets you halfway. And it's like, it's time to do this movie. And uh, I, I'm glad we're doing it right now. Uh, it's nice since we're still trapped inside after one year <laughs> to pretend that we're uh, on the high seas. Uh, going to the Galapagos Islands. Or I something. did see somebody point out that, that, like, that's a very realistic thing for why sea shanties are popular. That like everybody's trapped in a confined space, not knowing when they'll be free, and yearning for the days when they can go to bars and pick up wenches again. Oh, I see. So, if you're a wench, you can uh, reach me at Austin <laughs> at SpectatorFilmPodcast dot com. That's the email. Wenches, email me. W- wenches only. Wenches only, though. Yeah. Um, but anyway, um, Max, what's your I'll experience take wenches, with this movie? I take wenches and whalers, just to let you know. Oh. <laughs> oh, okay. What's my experience with this yeah. film, you asked, though? Yeah. Um, I saw this in theaters when it came out, and it was one of those movies that it came out exactly around the time of Pirates of the Caribbean. Same year. Yes. Although and, several months after. Yes, and I remember seeing it with the sort of like frame set of like a young younger person who had just seen Pirates of the Caribbean, so ship movies seemed cool. And I kind of saw it through that frame when I was younger. Mm-hmm. But I remember like it feeling very, very different. I still really, really liked it when I was a kid because it was a fucking cool-ass ship movie with military people doing stuff. And I liked it. But it always stuck with me, and I, I rewatched it a couple of times over the years, but not too much. But rewatching it for the podcast now, it's a very different type of film. And... I'm not going to get too much into this now, but like it sort of has me feeling a yearning for a what if universe of what if this took off into a big franchise, not for the same audience for a different audience, but what if this had sparked this same kind of fervor that pirates of the Caribbean did and what kind of film landscape would that be? Yeah. And I think they're a very natural point of comparison, especially for both you and I, cause we were both sort of children when these movies came out. I, I even younger than you and, um, I remember seeing this movie multiple times in the theater and really being like blown away. I didn't even understand totally all that was happening. Oh, 100% same. I'll bring up a funny thing. Um, Because this movie doesn't talk down to its audience, but it did not matter because the energy was so strong. Um, 
the craft was so uh, the, the dedication to the craft and and everything about it was so like committed uh, that it still as a kid I picked up on all of that even if I didn't understand all the details and uh, it's just a fascinating movie I. Later on, of course, growing older, I have come to appreciate this movie as a film directed by Peter Weir, a really great Australian director, and uh, this being a really interesting movie in his career as well. And uh, I just think there's a lot of interesting things about this movie. We've been wanting to do it for a long time. I think this movie, to really summarize my thoughts on it, is in some ways, in my mind, like the essence of what I could hope for a studio movie to be. It is a big budget action movie. It's got broad appeal, but that doesn't keep it from being challenging at different moments. Uh, that doesn't keep it from uh, not holding its audience hand too much. Um, and that doesn't keep it from having a really strong commitment to uh, character instead of a very you know uh, linear, um, easily recognizable plot. These are all things that would have been easier choices to make and they didn't make them. And the thing is, they didn't make those easy choices, and yet the movie remains just as accessible and exciting and as much of a blockbuster as uh, Pirates of the Caribbean. It's just a different type of movie. It it, it really is. And I, it, it strikes such a different different vibe than Pirates of the Caribbean, where it's just like, doing research for this movie, I really looked into... Cause I, I knew the books existed. One of my uncles has read a lot of them. There's like 20 odd books. There's so many of them. Yeah. They're written by a world war two veteran who like returned from the war and was like writing these Napoleonic war stories and like kind of wanted to, from what I can tell the doctor character is almost his self insert character to a uh. degree where like he wants to be this like warrior slash naturalist who goes along and like, he wants to be a philosopher king brings enlightenment to this war torn land. And it's like, it's interesting looking at it from that aspect. It's interesting looking at it from a 100% male movie. Yeah. And this is a dude's rock canon. Kind of, yeah. but like not in like a nauseating way, like no, 300. No, it is an interesting case study to unpack in terms of the masculinity. I of wish this movie. Yeah. We were talking about this. I wish movies about men, had the sort of subtlety and the skilled performances that this movie has because uh you know so many movies about men are just they just come off as shallow and in movies like this just show that that has no relationship to real life and no bearing on like actual human beings yeah and one of the few movies i enjoy russell crowe in so yeah maybe the only one i really like him in he's great in this um but yeah i i want to save most of it for the commentary track but i do think that's interesting i do also want to mention though since this movie has become more of a trending topic uh i'm kind of glad because that frees us up to maybe play devil's advocate a little bit uh where you know maybe people take for granted more that this movie is really compelling and interesting and we can play devil's advocate and see like oh what what what's about with the politics of this movie what's going on there uh and i'm really excited to do that because this is m more than anything else max this is a movie made in the 21st century that is a real movie. This is not a blockbuster temple franchise shit that's basically like a lunchbox in film But form. it does feel, like you said, like an old-time blockbuster. This like, is like a classic Hollywood, uh, old-timey Hollywood movie in a lot of ways, just with modern aesthetics. So, yeah, um, it's a real movie, and uh, that's just something I love from these big studio movies. It's just amazing when you... When you see that now. No, it's great. Let's, but I think we should cast away our sails and get going on the episode, Austin. All right, I'm ready to depart. Let's go. Choo choo. And here we are, my friends. Yes, Master and Commander. We're finally doing it, Max. Are you ready? After all these years. This was kind of like one of those movies that was, we didn't mention this, but it was like a both pick. I think we pretty pretty easily hammered that. I hope so. We yeah. both have been wanting to do this movie for a long time. Uh, it's a career best for Russell Crowe and Paul Bettany. And uh, Paul Bettany, yeah, 100%. I really, really enjoy him in this movie. We didn't mention him much in the intro. But no, he's he great. He really carries a lot of this. He's great. I mean, this movie is carried in a lot of ways by performance, um, but it's a career best for both of them, and it's just like, it just oozes character, this movie. Just oozes character. 
And everyone wanted to get in on it. If you're watching this along with us, you're going to see that uh, we have had three studio tags so far. And uh, it's almost like they all just like came together to try to make this movie. They all had to pitch in to make it happen. And, and then Miramax dove in at the last <laughs> second. Harvey Weinstein had to get his thumbprint on this somehow. Fucking Napoleon. Ruining everything. Welcome back always. to the podcast, Napoleon. <laughs> from Time Bandits. Yes. Um, this is the missing episode from Time Bandits. The coolest episode from Time Bandits. I might have enjoyed Time Bandits more if <laughs> they just happened to end up in this movie. Time point. Bandits isn't bad. Nipples on men. You remember that. The ending of Time Bandits is fine, but not one of my favorite films we've done here on the podcast. Oh, it's fine. It's fine. Nipples on men, Max. That's a line from Time Bandits. I'm yes. not just saying that, by the way, to our <laughs> listeners. We're we're not starting off on that crazy. Panel. Austin's gonna... just listing things he likes. Nipples on men. Time Bandits and nipples on men. <laughs> just <laughs> just two things. Speaking of men. There's a lot of men in this movie. Yeah. 99.9% men in this movie, actually. I, I think there are two women this entire time. Maybe one. Uh, there's one woman throughout the entire movie. Do you okay. know who it is? Is it the like the slave woman type thing? Or what? The woman on the boat that like... No. No. What there's is only it? dudes on this boat. This is a dude cruise. <laughs> there's a woman on a smaller boat is what I was saying. That's one woman. Yeah. The other woman I'm talking about is the ship herself. Oh, yeah. Off, always gendered feminine. And that is going to be an interesting thing in terms of the subtext of this movie where, you know, we're, we're going to talk about, like, the way gender plays a role in this movie, and we're going to talk about how that plays a role in the idea of, like, authority as it's depicted in the naval combat type movie. I mean, I guess that's the first question of this, of this commentary track is, like, what is the genre of this movie? Naval movies like this are a little bit tricky to pin down. In a lot of ways. Well, because we jokingly brought up the guy who added Russell Crowe on Twitter saying this movie is boring. And, like, if you go in expecting, like, I guess Pirates of the Caribbean, like, nonstop, like, yeah, just big rollicking adventure, you're not going to get that. This movie has, like, two and a half action, like, full fledged action scenes, yeah, throughout the entire time. And the rest of that is crew interaction and stress. And clashing of ideologies and men being men back in the days when yeah. men could be men. And furthermore, there is there is almost no plot in this movie. The plot, we've gotten it in the title crawl thing. Uh, the, the thing that reads like a letter. It's kind of like, it's just like, okay, we have their orders that they need to do. We know what their objective is. Find this friendship. That's it. Yeah, You've done it. The movie, like the movie progresses linearly, but the plot is almost non-existent. Um, it, the movie is consisting of a lot of like little micro episodes. This movie is built uh, in sort of like a vignette fashion. And um, sometimes they, they in like a montage format, they kind of like lead into another part of the movie. But it is every, almost even every shot, Max, on a structural level. It's like every shot is its own little story, you know? Like, every shot is its own discrete idea of something that's happening on the ship. We're going to see so many little details presented in each shot. Everything is constructed kind of episodically and vignette-like. Um, and it creates, at least in this movie, I can see that on paper maybe not sounding appealing and, and sounding boring. But it creates a sense of inertia in this movie where it's just like, yep, it's a chase plot. Uh, and we're just chasing them. And it kind of, like, doesn't let you catch your breath in a way that's really great. I think the structure of this movie and the way it plays with that, uh, it just works perfectly. Of course, the performances are a big part of why it works as well. We mentioned that Paul Bettany and Russell Crowe are great in this movie. There's, I'm going to say there's no bad performances in this movie. No, not at yeah. all. Uh, uh, we they're were, all doing great. We were watching some of the behind the scenes for this, but like they went through an <laughs> agonizing casting process for this movie where like, they were just sort of like grabbing people based on like, from what I could tell, like the defeated, lifeless look in there. <laughs> <laughs> right. According to Peter Weir. Yeah. He's like, I want someone that looks like they've been at sea for years. I want somebody who's just dead inside. And Can we give them a scurvy? It's beyond putting on a face to look happy for the camera. Yeah. That is the kind of person I want in this movie. 
And it does create a good atmosphere for this. Because basically they made this movie through... Uh, I'll talk about this more later, but they basically took the mizzen scene approach to making this movie in a lot of ways, in a way that might be comparable to Werner Herzog, where it's like, they just did it a lot <laughs> with a lot of this stuff. They just did, they put these people on a ship. They put them through training. They segregated them on the set according to their rank as characters. You know, they just did it. But in doing so, they capture something on film that gives it a type of docudrama realism that's very interesting and also very important, I think, to the genre. Speaking of genre, Max, you're talking about comparing it to Pirates of the Caribbean. I don't. Can we just remark upon how fucking similar the opening scene of Pirates of the Caribbean and this are? Yeah, they really are quite very similar. And I think it goes to show how, like, you know, you can have vaguely similar plot elements and it's just the stylistic treatment and the attitude towards those things makes all the difference. And, and also, I think it's worth pointing that out because something that we'll talk about in terms of Peter Weir's career as a director, something very important to his films is that sense of mysticism, which is more explicit in an Avenger movie like Pirates of the Caribbean, but is in this movie nonetheless. This movie also has a type of mysticism uh, about it and a, an idea of destiny and fate and stuff like that. And uh, it's more subtle than Pirates of the Caribbean, but I think... I think scenes like this where you notice the surface level similarities really point to like, oh, they are kind of tackling similar subject matter in some ways. Both great movies, though. I, we haven't really talked about our opinion of Pirates of the Caribbean. The first one is a classic, whether or not like the franchise went on to a spiraling mess. It did eventually. Yeah. I do like the second and third one, but the first one is undeniably great. I like ideas in the second and third one i think as movies they're sprawling messes but yeah they are messes i like the messes though they're they're like nice messes i enjoy the mess as somebody who likes one piece i love the idea of there being like a pirate council and there being representatives from every pirate big pirate crew and there's pirate royalty i love that shit that's exactly the kind of stuff was, I want. was keith richards in one piece it's not a pirate not lord. yet, but it's been going on pretty <laughs> long, so there's still a chance. Maybe when we get the inevitable live-action One Piece movie in the what, U.S. What will die first, One Piece <laughs> or Keith Richards? Ooh, I don't know. Probably One Piece. Uh, it depends. He says he's probably going to end it within five years. Oh, now. I thought you were going to say Keith Richards is saying he's going to kill himself. <laughs> <laughs> he's saying he's kind of done now. <laughs> I don't know, guys. I'm good at done. God, Russell Crowe is so good in this movie. I think he's just so middling and uninteresting. I honestly had like, season. until we started doing this again, I honestly forgot Russell Crowe was the lead in this movie just because I hadn't seen it in a couple, like several years. Mm -hmm. And it was just like positive association of lead actor in my brain and non-positive association with Russell Crowe in general. It's just Russell Crowe. It's not like he's terrible. It's just like, I just don't care. Nothing about him makes me care. And I know he's a huge douchebag in person. Uh, Russell Crowe, if you're listening to this because you're the type of person who would do that, you know where I am. You we'll can come find on, me. We'll at him on Twitter after this episode comes come out. Come find me. I'll beat your ass. <laughs> um, no, you, this is your only good movie, Russell Crowe. Uh, I don't care about any of the other movies you've done. Um, and uh, I'm ja, ja. And your singing voice is terrible. <laughs> God-awful singing voice. Oh, I doubt he could even sing a shanty. Can't even get in on the TikTok craze. <laughs> Can you imagine Russell Crowe on TikTok? I mean, by the time this episode comes out, it's going to be ancient history. Old people have already discovered it, so the meme is dead anyway. But the shanty? Yeah. Yeah, it's too fast. Everything's accelerating. Nothing can exist in the culture anymore. <laughs> it's unfortunate. That was the, for like, I'm, as I've said before, I'm a fan of the Zoomers. I, th I think <laughs> they're good. I guess they just want to make a bunch of videos of them getting together on the internet and singing sea shanties together. Eh, let's not let's not come to a conclusion too soon. All right. Okay. Zoomers have pr plenty of problems, I'm sure. I don't know. All I know is that this movie is going to be my future. After the post apocalypse, I would like to be on a boat like this. Bold of you to assume there still be oceans in the future. That's all there will be. I'll just It'll be like Waterworld. 
you know what? I want to be Dennis and Hopper then, and Waterloo. Then all the oceans will evaporate and they'll just be burning hot. No, no, they won't evaporate. They'll just acidify. You can't drink them anymore. It'll kill everything in the oceans and destroy the ecosystem destabilization. But Max, th- uh, by the way, just to interrupt our dumb conversation, scenes like this, it, th- you're going to notice so many shots where these just like little unforgettable, indelible details, right? The idea of them throwing sand on the floor of the infirmary to keep the blood from, you know, uh, getting too slippery so they can have grip with their feet, right? The idea of Russell Crowe looking out the busted uh, hatch where the uh, cannon goes, right? Every little shot is its own image, discrete image or kind of like vignette micro story, right? Just throwing the sand on the floor, that's its own little story. Every single shot has that, you know? And it makes it makes the boat and the like setting feel like its own organic thing because it's like well, and they don't It stop doesn't hold your hand. No, and they don't stop to tell you that, but they just give you enough visual cues to infer that by yourself. It's never just like, "But why would you put sand on the floor, doctor?" Because uh, no. And one thing that Peter Weir did say was that he, like, <sighs> like this with them on the rudder, you know, investigating the damage. I mean, it makes sense, but it's like, whoa, he's just hanging off by a rope. Yeah, but I'm saying to, in, re- in reference to his approach to directing this movie, he said that, like, when you take a book, you pick it up and all of the words fall out of it. And you just have, like, the front cover, the back cover, and the ghost of all these characters and plot that you need to fill in with a visual medium. And that's something that like you can explain very quickly in text format, but like yeah, into this without making the movie feel awkward and less fast paced during this action scene. How the fuck do you do that? Because novels are by definition exposition. Exactly. You're giving, you're always, that's, that's like a fundamental difference between like literature and film is that film, it, it gets to like a semiotic element of it where like film doesn't have to necessarily signify anything. You know, like semiotics, you have a signifier and a signified, right? So (laughs) I say the word rhino, right? Rhino is the word. The signified is a rhino, you know? Yeah. Whereas in film, they show us stuff and it's like, what's the inherent meaning of any given shot? You know, we can only construct it contextually, you know? Um, It's not often that you see a movie and it's like this shot really inherently has meaning. In fact, if ever that happens, whereas with words even though language has arbitrary meaning, it's like, yeah, the word rhino means something. And that's just a little digression into semiotics. But it is getting at the exact difference that you're talking about. And I think fundamentally, it's why shit like this works when they don't explain anything. Because it's addicting to watch just process, you know? And it doesn't stop. And it's what it is, it makes something that's incredibly kinetic, you know? It's just, it's inherently exciting to watch, even though you have no idea what's happening all the time. I mean, we can... But you un- know it's frantic, and you know you're rooting for these guys. Yeah, and that's why it's well-directed. It's because even if you don't know the specifics of it, you have an idea of what their objectives in every moment they need to accomplish is. Like, when I was a kid, I understood that they were, like, towing the boat, but I didn't understand why. I didn't understand that the rudder was busted <laughs> and that they needed to, like, get the fuck out of there. And even there are still things I don't understand, Max. I don't understand why before they engage with the boat, they actually have the little skit, uh, the little skiffs like dangling out attached to one another behind their ship. I don't get why they need to do that, but who cares? Because the thing is we're watching characters living and breathing in their world and act and just in motion. And we don't have to pause to explain. It's great. No. And they know what the importance is. And if it comes up again, You'll find out through context clues. Yeah. Otherwise, it's just going to be a thing that's happening. And now that we're talking about this, like, very frenetic, um, energetic editing style, I do kind of want to comment on the heritage of the sort of naval war film. And I guess just mention that it kind of reminds me of the energy and and frenetic pace of some of those Soviet-era movies from the silent era. Um, Those classics, like, you know, Strike or or uh, Battleship Potemkin, the Eisenstein movies specifically. Okay. Um, I'm not saying that they they particularly have the same, like, 
formal implications in terms of the editing in this movie and the difference between them where I, I, I think, <laughs> I don't think anyone would challenge me on this, but Battleship Potemkin is kind of a better movie than this movie. <laughs> How dare you say that um, one of the most fundamental <laughs> movies of the last century. B- but Battleship Potemkin is very poetic and, and you know, very deep as well. And, like, the point of the editing in that is, I think, fundamentally different, different than this. But the idea of how it's structured creates a similar um, sort of experience for the viewer, I think, when you're watching it. Like, the action scenes in this are just riveting, but when you really look at it, it's the type of action that I don't know about you, Max, but for me, m- might not at first blush be the most exciting. I really enjoy action where you can see real things happening, um, which is sort of, it's not the opposite of editing, but it's like I like extended takes in action. Um, I like mizzen scene being the main organizing principle with the action. Whereas with a lot of the action in this, there's a lot of cutting around and editing, but it gets past it because every single shot is kind of like its own vignette. And it's showing like a group of people working in tandem in a way that's really energetic. So it goes for something else and it works, totally works. And then when you have these downtime scenes, it, it, it also works perfectly because it kind of transitions into a different type of movie. It's no longer an action movie. It's kind of a domestic um, domestic dispute movie kind of you know it's, it's marriage story at sea. <laughs> well we should also talk about sexuality in this movie because there there have been pe- some people talking about like um is just gay vibes in this movie i don't know how i feel about that in the Navy. i'm curious about it <laughs> I, I, that's exactly yeah. the idea i mean you can make jokes about that inside and listen i know there is a large uh master and commander fan fiction community for that kind of stuff what yeah um is there like a tumblr fanfic of like them boning ao3 yeah um you have you found this no well no i don't have it with me but i know uh it's like some people who have gone on to write erotic like fiction that sells started in like the master and commander fandom <laughs> okay so I know it's out there and there's an appetite for that out there for all the horny wine moms who his husband dragged them to this movie and then because you know you liked it wine moms you yeah. know you liked it too you know you like this movie too so your uncles and dads love this movie and they're right admit it <laughs> so you wrote some steamy fan fiction about Paul Bettany and Russell Crowe and you know what that's that's fine that's fine that's you do fine. you just be honest about it yeah just be honest that this movie's good Oh, here's the first scene of exposition in the entire movie. They explain what the wind gauge is and why they had to jump on them and why they got their asses kicked. Because they're mean to that one guy who said he saw the ship the first time. Oh, we'll get to that. (laughs) Let's talk about the stakes in this movie. There are none, except for the characters. They were talking about like, oh, it could tip the war in Napoleon's favor. Does yes, anything in this point. movie like imply that we should care or, <laughs> or anything about Napoleon? Nothing exists beyond the boundaries of the horizon in this movie. It's just this ship. I would say that's a... By the way, getting back to the gay stuff, uh, I would say that's potentially a, a lascivious line, Max. They're talking about... like It's just in, like, okay, the obvious thing to ship is Paul Bettany and Russell Crowe, right? Paul Bettany's like, is this an aged man of war? And then Russell Crowe says, am I an aged man of war? Would you call me an aged man of war? Yes. And then he's describing the ship kind of compared to himself. Yeah. And then he, like, with a little smirk, he's like, she's very fast if she's well handled. I don't know, Max. I don't know. He, Here's the thing. he has puns. He has puns. We know that. And puns are the fundal. Yeah foundation of a good gay relationship obviously yes but here's the thing 50 percent of me really does just want to be like yeah sure let's let's write this fanfic as we watch this film but also like if i want to be a spoil sport for a second this movie does place a lot on the value of male friendships and just like 
bonds between men and dudes being dudes. And that's just as important yes. as gay relationships. Have, having wholesome male friendships is not something that like you see in film. It's a, would you even say it's more rare than like implied homosexuality? Yeah. I think it's easier to imply it's a, homosexuality. It's easier to play homosexuality for a joke in a lot of yeah. movies. So, yeah, I'm just like, oh, I'm sorry, man. I don't feel that way about you. We're just, just bros, right? But or, or they, you know, they try to have a friendship, but they always have to have the gay panic moment. Yeah, I'm thinking like an Independence Day when <laughs> Harry Connick Jr. is doing the thing where he's like, hold me. He- <laughs> Junior, he's like, um, he's like kneeling. Oh wait, it looks like he's proposing. Can we not talk about Independence Day and the fucking scene that scarred me as a small child watching? This didn't scar me until I think the third time I saw it because I didn't understand what they were doing. I remember seeing this in theaters whenever the fuck, however old I was, and me just being like, "What the shit, my dude? <laughs> this is a thing you can show in movies? Just a kid getting his arm cut off? It's so anticlimactic. Yeah, you know, he's just kind of sitting there. It's it's a really amazing way to approach the scene. And obviously the actor does a great job too. Oh my God. This is what happened when you got a broken arm just like 150 years ago. He didn't even have a broken arm. He just had a bad splinter. No, he said it was an earlier scene. He got a broken arm. Oh, from okay. It. This is what happened. Still though, it was a bad splinter. Yeah. It's not the broken arm, Max. It's the fact that it was infected. And they're all just doing this. And this is, speaking of the dude's rock nature of this movie, there's something weirdly wholesome about the way this character grows and develops that I really appreciate. In the way that they set up the interactions with the rest of the crew, where, like, you know, it's terrible, but, like, losing limbs is such a part of life for these people that it's almost like it's not a point of judgment for anyone. You know? It's interesting. Like, no one, they bring up, like, he doesn't have an arm anymore. And that does limit him, but it doesn't stop any... It doesn't really change anything about the way people interact with him for the rest of the movie. No, not at all. I find it really interesting. If anything, it like, they makes him more accepted. Like, Yeah, because Lord Nelson also is missing an arm. Yeah. And it becomes... Well, they don't consciously make it like a, a, like a good fortune thing, but I think it's implied that that kid is very precocious and it's kind of like he's going to be the next Lord Nelson. Only he'll be like a, you know a Lord Nelson of the new age. He'll be more of a naturalist perhaps than, than the warrior. Be the enlightened philosopher King that we all need. <laughs> I would have liked to see that movie where they just wander around a Brazilian rainforest for Russell Crowe yelling at them. <laughs> That's not the right tree. Max, that movie is called a the wrath of God. Okay. Another movie we've been wanting to do on the show for a long time. Another movie and about we, people we on boats. Austin. I do like Werner Herzog a lot. He was great in The Mandalorian. That's oh, all he's off. in. That's all he's in, right? Fuck off. The Mandalorian. Fuck you. Star you Wars. You bring up Star Wars and <laughs> Paul Bettany's best scene. Paul Bettany is so good in this movie. Every little look he gives is just perfect. I just love this. Again, episodic structure. This contributes absolutely nothing to the narrative, but it's just so propulsive in terms of what it shows us about character and the nature of the crew. (laughs) I just love this. We're watching right now the scene where Paul Bettany is uh, performing open brain surgery on one of the sailors, and he's going to put in like a a coin to hold the skull together. (laughs) Yeah. Basically, he's... he's, and he's screwing a, a coin to someone's skull because he has a fracture in his skull. And he had to open up his skull to do it. And he's doing it on a boat. And the entire crew is watching because they're like, when the fuck are you going to see this ever again? I can't believe we have hobbits on board. They really did. Billy Boyd. Yeah. Billy Boyd is in this movie. Fresh off of Return of the King. The Oscar winniest movie of all time. This movie would have won more Oscars if not for Return of the oh, King. Oh, it was nominated for so many of the same things. And then Return of the King just swept because yeah. the Oscars were just like, well, fuck, we have to give it to him now. Did you, I don't know if any, like for some of our younger listeners, you might not remember, but that was like the funniest fucking year at the Oscar. Why? <laughs> it was just like every re- every award. It was just like, and the winner is Lord of the Rings, the Return of the King. And the winner is... <laughs> It's just for every category. Do you have a um? Do you have a favorite Lord of the Rings movie? The Two Towers. 
It's objectively the best one. Ooh, disagree. I disagree, but I think it's... Why? Why is it your favorite? Um, I think it's the best closed. Uh, like, if you're just look, looking at them as, like, individual movies, The Two Towers, like, has a beginning, middle, and an end that works just as its own standalone movie. Like, where his fellowship is clearly leading up to bigger things and Return of the King is taking a lot and trying to divest it, and that's why it ends five times. That's but. true, because it has to... <laughs> it's like a closed... It has to keep closing each loop... At every level. And I love all of the movies, so it's just like yeah. slight things. But also They're, They are three discrete movies, but also one whole movie. Yeah. Yeah. And also, The Two Towers has the most Christopher Lee in it. So. That's true. It does have the most Christopher Lee. I'm going to say Fellowship is my favorite, though. Um, also has a fair amount of Christopher Lee in it. Yeah. Third one has no Christopher Lee in it. Which like, is, except the extended edition, where he is thrown which, off the tower. Which is also preferable, because that scene is kind of... I don't know. It's it's kind of significant to know what happened to, <laughs> to Saruman, but also you get the you get speaking of Australians and Peter Weir, you get Bruce Spence in that movie. Yeah, in the extended one where he's the mouth of Sauron going like. Rah, 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 rah. Yeah, exactly. That was the entire. Scene. Rah, 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 rah. It was very weird. And then they cut off his head. It's great. He should have thrown snakes at them like from the Road Warrior. <laughs> he would have gotten away if that were the case. Max, if you spill. More alcohol on the couch. I will spill as much as I, I will want. Keel haul you. I was listening to pirate metal on the way here to get in the mood for the. Oh, <laughs> there's a song called Keel Hauled. Yeah. Sh- shout outs to Eels- Ailstorm. Ailstorm. A plus, 10 out of 10. Best Scottish pirate metal band there is. The only pirate metal band. That, that's the joke, yeah. The only one we need. We don't need more than them. It's like when Flight of the Concord says that they're the second most popular folk punk comedy duo of New Zealand. You're setting a very small category for yourself and being the best in that. So, Max, I want to return to the question of genre. Yes. Have we decided what genre this is? Because clearly we're differentiating it's it. It's a from- drama. The period drama in my that's that's okay a period piece yes, but would you say it's a war movie? Um, no, not so much. I would because I'd say this is a war movie. The actual ideological conflict of the war that's not important. Like literally, we just get orders to fucking find this vessel, and it's more about what the order means to the captain how far he's willing to proceed it, whether or not he's within his rights to keep doing what he does throughout the entire movie, how that affects his friends and his crewmen. That's what the movie's really about. It's not about the war. It's right. not about the battles. I don't see that as a requirement for war movies. Though. I think it's a historical drama that takes place during a war. I don't think it's primarily a war movie. But everything is set up by the fact that they're engaging in naval combat. I think this is a naval war film. I guess, but it's more of the ideological approach of like a sailor who knows the real world and like a scholar who knows the facts behind it but doesn't have as much front hand experience with it. But they are at war in this movie. So technically, it is a movie about war. Okay. And every movie is also a romance film as well because there's always romances. But what I'm saying is like. I, I just, I feel like there's a generic pull with this where it, just because it is belonging in that genre to me doesn't mean it has to, you know, abide by a certain set of rules or. No, it's just that when you call this movie a war movie, because we pointed out that like your uncle and your grandpa really like this movie. Yes. <laughs> and that's because it can come off like the uncle that I have likes this, like he showed me the, have you ever seen the World War II movie Stalingrad? It's like a German film. I don't know. I don't um, think so. It appeals to the same instincts in yeah. people as, as war movies. I remember like that. watching that movie's like miserable and people are just dying in the cold the entire yeah. time. Your your uncle that loves this movie also loves Saving Private Ryan. Yeah. He and showed, that movie sucks ass. He showed it to me when I was like 10 years old. And like, so like, it's that kind of thing. And like, if you read it purely as a war movie of like, look at all these people during the Napoleonic Wars doing man stuff. Yes. You, it You have to draw the conclusion that it's just a war movie and that's why they like it. But like, I have always, like, there's more to that, this movie than that. And I always felt people who liked it solely for, like, I watched the History Channel back when cable was a thing 24 7 for World War II documentaries. Like, if you're just taking the movie at that value, 
then eh. I, I feel like you're missing a huge component of it. Sure, but I'm what I'm saying is I think that doesn't just that doesn't make it not a war movie. I think that just makes it a war movie that plays by different rules, perhaps, or has different goals than the norm, and that maybe makes it more compelling outside of that framework. Okay. I I definitely do think this is a naval war movie because I feel like it shares a lot of um, generic tendencies with that type of movie, and I'm thinking of specifically like American again sort of throwback classic Hollywood movies from the 40s. These movies are more like propaganda movies, movies like In Which We Serve or like Action on the North Atlantic, et cetera, et cetera. Well, speaking of propaganda, you brought up to me that apparently in the original book, hey, it's the only woman in the movie. Yes, it is. But you brought up to me that in the original Far Sides of the World book, the 10th book in this series, that they're chasing after an American ship. I don't know, because this is a combination of books. Yeah. So I don't know if that's the one that is the far side of the world. One of the books is called The Far Side of the World. I don't know whether that's the one where they're chasing the Acheron or whatever. All I know is that in the source material, the ship they're chasing is an American ship, and they changed it. Obviously to appeal more to a U.S. audience. Exactly. We can tolerate them chasing those filthy Frenchmen, but... Second week in a row, two movies dealing with these dastardly French. These British people are seconds away from, you know, pulling out their freedom fries. Freedom chips in the UK, actually. (laughs) Oh, you're right. Freedom chips. Now the British were already ahead of us of not naming anything after the French. (laughs) They had centuries of hitting them. We were new to that party. Hey, people in the UK, when are you going to start a war with France again? When can we get that going again? They can't. They're too busy not getting any of their medication because they finally made Brexit go through. We have no chips left. Sorry, people in the UK. If you're listening to the show in the UK, you probably you we don't wanna we don't wanna rub salt in your eyes, but you know. <laughs> but we get to be cocky Americans because we just got rid of Trump like t- five <laughs> days ago. And now racism in the US is over. Well, I don't of know course. if you've heard. It's so, over. It's done. So now we can tut tut you for having Boris Johnson as your prime minister <laughs> yes. and somehow being more bigoted towards transgender people than us. It's quite an accomplishment, honestly. It's a but, competition. We'll see yeah. what U.S. responds with. <laughs> Speaking of war and, and mythologizing and stuff, scenes like this are very interesting. I think, I think the other thing that really sticks out to me about this being a naval war movie is that they often have this idea of like domesticity scenes kind of coexisting within the combat scenes of uh, the war film because of the, you know, the limited space of a, of a boat out at sea Um, compared to the infantry film. I mean, the infantry film is the de facto war movie. And then anything else in my mind is kind of like a subgenre or deviation from it. Um, And the Naval film often seems to, again, have more of these domestic scenes, and it seems to more acutely stage a type of Oedipal drama. Uh, The idea of, like, challenging the patriarchal authority of the captain for authority of the ship. That seems to happen way more often in naval uh, combat movies, naval war movies, than than other places. Even though the sort of questioning of, of authority is something that comes up in a lot of war movies. As we're seeing right here, in an, a great character detail where uh, Paul Bettany doesn't toast to Lord Nelson. Yeah. Because he does not respect the British Empire. Oh, and the best scene in the entire film. Yeah, the best <laughs> joke, at least. Um, but again, Paul Bettany, e- even in that moment, he, he was just talking about what we were talking about, the you know questioning of authority and Lord Nelson, where Paul Bettany sort of poking at the myth of Lord Nelson and the myth of nationality. Paul Bettany, obviously considers himself to be a citizen of the world and, you know, kind of doesn't care for British nationality. (laughs) The lesser of two weevils. The lesser of two (laughs) weevils. He's been waiting his whole life. (laughs) I do love that, like... That is some good acting on Russell Crowe's part. I'll have to say, like, yes. the delivery of that line of, like, he's laughing, telling it halfway through. Yes, because he's, like, he's so proud of himself. <laughs> yes. That's what it is. He's, he, Russell Crowe in that. Uh, Ru- <laughs> it's like when you successfully, like, 
get somebody to say like when you like go like up dog to somebody and they're like what's up dog like when you get that off <laughs> like it's just like ah, <laughs> i got gotcha. you or you get someone with uh ligma yeah i'm a ligma male what's a ligma male yes <gasps> ligma balls i love that Listeners, if you send me an email with the name <laughs> Ligma, I will love you. It's going to be the most emails you ever get. <laughs> but uh, to get back to that question of authority, I think it happens very acutely in the naval war film. Wouldn't you say like a lot of naval war films do have that threat of mutiny? That doesn't really happen in this movie as much. We get a little bit of it, but not really that much. You know, it's kind of an outlier in that sense. But um, nonetheless, it sets those things up. And that's another reason why I feel like it's part of the sort of naval war film category. But what were we talking about before that? Because I brought that up for a specific reason. So it's the thing here, like, I know they don't trust him. Oh, of the superstition. Stuff. Okay, let's set this up for our audience. Yeah. So there's an officer, right? That they kind of do not that the sailors do not like, and obviously he's off- bad at commanding them. Yes, he's indecisive. The movie really sets up that there's a class difference on the ship between officers and the sailors, the normal sailors, the commoners. Um, even if that difference is often harmonious, because the officers are good at leading. Uh, As the movie says, in this one case, the normal people do not like this one particular officer. Um, And they have started conjuring up superstitions about him. So wait, what was your question about it? So I I was just wondering whether or not like him singing along was gauche because they didn't like him and he should know that or because he's an officer and he's not supposed to engage with like. My impression was that it's a little bit of both. But also, I think if you're an officer, you're not supposed to engage. You're supposed to facilitate for the men to have their own space. Yeah. I mean, and that's something that continues into the military today. Like, there's all sorts of rules, at least in the U.S. military, as far as I'm aware, where it's like, you know, they'll, like, U.S. military will spend money to completely segregate quarters, living spaces, uh, uh, places for recreational areas for officers from normal people, from recruits or whatever. It still remains completely separated. Tell you the devil's in there. I got a coin in my head. <laughs> Honestly, Max, I would listen to whatever the fuck that guy had to say. <laughs> he has the hold fast tattoos on his hand. And he has I wonder a- if that's what happened to Drill. Is that how Drill got so good at tweeting? Someone did put a coin in his fucking head? Yes. That is actually Drill. That is the actual person. <laughs> that old man. <laughs> He's still alive. He has not aged today. He still looks exactly <laughs> like missing, it, missing his two front teeth. Yeah, exactly. It's that tweet, but like, you actually, you fucking idiot. There's actually zero difference between good things and bad things, you fucking moron. You goddamn moron. Yeah. Or no, what does it begin? The wise man said. Yeah. There's zero difference between good things and bad things. You fucking idiot. Well, you every, goddamn moron. Every drill tweet should honestly start with the wise man said. I know our listeners are probably incredibly online and uh, don't need a lecture on drill. But no, like, we don't need to. If you don't yeah. know it, then I'm not going to be the NPR article that tells old people (laughs) what internet things are but goddamn drill just i don't know (laughs) the quality of posting is unseen like i came home to my dad asking me if i knew how to do photoshop and i had the wherewithal to ask him why and he's like well i want to make a bernie meme and i'm just like no he wanted to do the mittens thing yeah what was he gonna put it in i don't know and i didn't care and i'm just like no i conscientiously object i wanted to put uh bernie in lady maria's chair um, from Bloodborne, but then I was like, I don't care <laughs> enough. It's going to take too much effort. Not at all. It's very easy to just grab it and put it anywhere. It's With Lady it. Maria, it would be harder to do well because she's got her, like, katana or whatever that she's holding. <laughs> just Photoshop the katanas coming out of one of each of the mittens. Yeah. Blanket recommendation for Bloodborne, by the way. If you like Master and Commander, check out Bloodborne. Very if you similar like Master vibes. and Commander, you probably have good enough taste to recognize that Bloodborne is fucking great. It's the only From Software game I finished, actually. That just makes you a loser. Yeah. Don't post your L's online, man. Yeah, I play Monster Hunter. I'm fine with it. 
But anyway, here we do- That was like a big rivalry for the longest time. What? Like the monster, before Monster Hunter World came out, like the Monster Hunter fandom and the Souls fandom like hated each other. Oh my God, I can't even think about this. This is so (laughs) stupid. We can't talk about this. We're going to lose all the grandpas listening to this episode. (laughs) Anyway, military. What's what's video games? Anyway, (laughs) military history, grandpa, come back. Come back. Come back, grandpa. They're shooting the French. Look. Don't you like it? They're shooting the dandy French. Or do you like the French from back in World War II? I can't remember. Have we talked about, too, just as a war movie and everything, like, this is one of the most romantic movies we've done on the show. Oh, yeah. Like, death is treated horribly and the injuries aren't washed over at all. But And at, yet. At the end of the day, this movie, like, all of this is a positive. I don't know if it's so much as a positive. It's just like, and it's like, it, it treats it as like de facto the way the universe is. Yeah, like this is life. And like, yeah. yeah, it can be shitty sometimes, but also that's life and to make the most of it. Yeah, it's interesting because it's like, it's so stylistically beautiful. There's so many moments of like abstract shapes and, and just pure formal inventiveness. And the acting is so great and the sense of camaraderie is so strong, right? And yet it treats everything in this very um, matter-of-fact way that often is only an advantage in movies where, to me, it feels very it feels very compelling when you let the action speak for itself, you know, instead of trying to trump it up with some sort of, like, artificial sense of drama or stakes. Um, they don't have to make it like, oh, okay, like, this this ship they're hunting has like the death star codes that are going to like explode up England, you know, like Napoleon's working on a new weapon. (laughs) Yeah. Like have faith in your actors, have faith that the, you know, the the audience is going to care that these actors survive and stay in one piece. And they do that and it works great, but also it does make it kind of compelling in term, like I don't want to say compelling, but it makes it very strong in terms of its uh, acceptance of its whatever its political view is, which in this movie, in my mind, is a little bit more conservative. It's like, yeah, it's taking it for granted that this is the way the world is. And the fact that it's not creating artificial drama makes that uh, a more binding case that it's making because it's less artificial. And I think some of the stuff with Paul Bettany later on and his conflicts with Russell Crowe's character might reinforce the idea that this movie has more conservative ideology yeah where it's like yes i acknowledge that science is important but first of all you have to realize it's mainly important because occasionally it leads to military discoveries (laughs) and second if i have to if we have to choose between funding your scientific endeavors and engaging in unnecessary and unordered military operations take a guess on which fucking one we're doing first, mate. Yeah. And also, you know, but the movie is slippery, right, Max? Because it places so much emphasis on character that I do not want to make the mistake of saying, like, it transcends an idea of nationalism. Only a rube would say that. Yeah. Nothing transcends the idea of nationalism. You can't do that. Only a white, like, rube would say that. However, this movie places such emphasis on character that I do think it it raises a question of priorities and what the movie's focus is. So maybe it has both, but I do think I would be surprised if people watch this movie and come away with a stronger sense of like rah rah country and patriotism than they do with the characters. It's more like England becomes a stand in for like just everybody on the boat. Yeah, honestly, like the jabs they take at the French are to hype them up for battle later on. But it's more just like, let's go get the enemy team. They don't such is the strength of the acting. You know, you just buy this community on the boat so much. Oh, oh 100%. I, lo- I would have loved to have been just doing this in real life. What a life to be doing this. Yeah, we're just standing up here on the top of the mast of the ship. Oh, we haven't talked about the actual production. Like, there. Let's get to it after uh, we finish talking about okay. the nationality. Sorry. Stuff. But I, I like. I don't know. I, I just think it's a very interesting thing because this movie is conservative and yet it tries so hard to. It seems to make deliberate attempts to steer away from the nationalism inherent in its story, aside from the fact that it changed the nation of the boat. Um, But again, it does seem to, especially with the ending, I think, try to establish the idea that this is primarily a character-driven story. Um, 
and something that is less about the stakes in terms of like nationhood and patriotism and more about the stakes in terms of a personal character story, you know? And I think it implies the same thing about the French captain, you know, where the French captain, what are they? They're a privateer. They care about France, really, or do they happen to be France? And it's just like this great dance that they do. These two captains going back and forth, hunting one another across the ocean. Yeah, because this captain, like, he doesn't seem to have any orders. His, like, orders seem to be just Well, he like, surpassed his orders. He yeah. says so. Or no, Russell Crowe does, but I'm saying the French captain. Yeah, his orders are just, like, wreak havoc. Yeah. Uh, capture as many British Whaling. whalers yeah. as you can. Fuck up their trade. Yeah. Like, we're not going to... It's sort of like the thing with privateers, right? The government would be like, hey, we're not going to, like, stop you from being pirates. You could just do that. And we encourage you to pirate our enemy's ships. But Max, this is a great time to get back to what you were saying with the special effects and just how they made this movie. Yeah, no, the the making of this is truly some remarkable stuff because as you put it, it's a every tool in the book type of situation where some of these are filmed on an actual boat that is like the same I believe the last surviving kind of that boat still available in the world. Oh, that, I don't know. That they bought. According to some of the behind the scenes stuff I watched, like the boat they filmed on is the last available <laughs> of the kind. Yeah, they got the specific model of boat that was recreated, right? And it, it just happened to be available and Peter Weir was like, can we buy this? Yeah. To the studio. And they, and they were, were like, like yeah, yeah, sure. 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 You can <laughs> buy the boat. Then they cr- recreated another one on a stage that they flooded so that they could film stuff in a controlled yeah. environment. They had it on a giant gimbal to move it back and forth. And then they also had several sound stages worth of like the below deck scenes for other angles of that. Yep. And then they have CGI for certain storms and whatnot. It's just like everything. So many different things to get what seems very like well flowing and you get a si- sense of the size of the ship. Pretty good in this movie, I would say. I, It's almost seamless. I noticed in the first action scene watching it this week, I noticed a few like placement areas for like fog and smoke elements. And then when cannons fire, if you, unless you really are used to special effects, you're not going to notice this. Um, that you can see smoke element placement areas and it sticks out a little. That's it. That is literally it. Uh, this movie's effects have aged incredibly well. And I'm going to say like most movies, like, their effects will age at some point to some degree and you'll be able to see just a little bit of behind the scenes for any movie, even some like special effects perfection. But yeah, no, this movie's special effects. In fact, Max, I think this is one of like this movie. Okay. One of the first things I really got into learning about movies was through Lord of the Rings. Right. And when I was a kid, like I used to, with my dad, go to Barnes and Noble or borders or whatever and we would get, he would pick me up the Cinefix magazine, which was a magazine just about special effects in movies. And I think I still have the, the Cinefix magazines on like Lord of the Rings movies and this movie. And I didn't understand any of the shit going on in there, but I loved looking at the different models and how they put everything together. And uh, you know what? This movie was made, the special effects in this, it was a dual special effects effort, um, but a lot of it was made by Weta special effects, the team that worked on Lord of the Rings. And I think the same effectiveness is at play here. You know, when you have a really ambitious movie and people are not sure how they're going to make it, they kind of just try everything. And sometimes that works amazing because they're constantly switching it up and you can never really see the seam because of that. And sometimes it ends up being a clusterfuck because you spent too much money on too many different things. Sometimes it's Johnny Mnemonic. Yeah. Oh, let's be honest. Nobody spent money on Johnny. <laughs> <laughs> I, I don't know. Maybe they, had, they spent their money on uh, Dolph Lundgren. <laughs> Jesus time, baby. <laughs> That's what this movie is missing. He just looks through his telescope and it's like Dolph Lundgren, captain of the other ship. I mean, religion. Jesus time. Is interesting in this movie, but it's not <laughs> to that level. We'll We'll get to religion and spiritualism in this movie a little later on but there, this is no, this is the half the action scene that's meant to hold you over 
yeah. until the end of the movie later on. But and, and this is the action scene that's meant to make you feel terrible. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, there's very little in this movie that's like trying to make you like feel super giddy besides some of the stuff on the Galapagos Islands. You know what? I, this movie doesn't really try to make you feel good. It does try to make you feel bad, though. Yeah. Um, when you feel good in this movie, it's just from the charm of the actors going back and forth. You know, it's the charm of the actors making the most out of a terrible, terrible fucking situation. But I like that approach because it's like, I'm putting faith in my actors to win through their charisma, the support of the audience. And then in these moments, it's like, no, this is really a terrible thing. And by the way, one of the worst ways to die we're about to see. I'm going to say in terms of like film deaths, this is definitely one of the worst that we've covered. And I don't know about We've you. covered some fucked up horror movies, but I guess... This is a, terrible. To a degree, there's like a cartoonishness to a lot of horror movie deaths that like kind of stop you from connecting with them. And that's yeah. what turn them into a spectacle. But this is just like awful. You're out in the middle of the ocean, cold. We should describe dark. what's happening. Oh, yeah. So... Somebody has fallen overboard after the mast, uh, the central mast of the ship was shot in half by the French. We're in the middle of a really great sequence in the movie where momentum picks up because uh, Captain Aubrey, um, Russell Crowe, does this really great naval maneuver where he kind of sneaks behind the other ship (laughs) and they get the jump on them. And And they're like, oh, man. And then a storm fucking hits. Right. And it completely derails the advantage they had. And then this character that we saw earlier in the movie who gave them the little model ship of the of the Acheron, right? So we have a little bit of relationship with this kind of extra character. Uh, he falls off the mast because it collapses, and it's tied by ropes to the ship. And there's a brief window where maybe you think this guy who's dangling on this mast has an opportunity to, to swim back to it yes. and get back on the ship. But if they do not cut the ropes... It's going to uh, sink the entire fucking yes. ship. The, the, the dangling mast out in the ocean is going to sink the rest of the ship, so they have to cut him loose. And now he doesn't die immediately. That'd be too easy. He sees them do it. Yeah. He sees them have to choose to do it. Terrible, terrible way to die. You're just left alone in the middle of the ocean until you're exhausted and, and going to drown. Yeah. yeah. Drown or freeze to death because you're, you get cramps. In or your some muscles. sharks, maybe. Who knows? No, he wouldn't be that lucky. <laughs> lucky to meet sharks. So yeah, wonderful, uplifting scene in the film. But everybody I, cheers, literally. But my point in bringing up the aesthetics of this moment is like this is when we get the beautiful like Thomas Tallis music, um, and we get we get music like that in highly emotional moments. In fact, the Fantasia on a theme keeps returning every time they suffer really great losses. It happens again at the end. Um, when the boy Calamy dies, you know, yeah. and they lose all those guys at the end. Um, spoilers. Oh, spoilers. Kids are going to die in this movie. <laughs> but I, I think it's interesting that the movie kind of offers that type of emotional um, manipulation and, and gives you the aesthetic force when bad things are happening and when good things are happening, it doesn't. I think it's a good way of establishing how hard this life is for them. Oh, he lost his bro. This is another character maybe people could ship as him and his bro. He just had to cut loose. Yeah, I'm not super familiar with what the popular ships are in the Master and Commander fandom. (laughs) The most popular ship is the Surprise. Hey. (laughs) Maybe the Cook and and this guy. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) The most popular ship. Comrade Solidarity of hating the fucking officers no he loves the officers he he just likes complaining he loves making chocolate pudding in the shape of the galapagos <laughs> Islands. <laughs> honestly i remember as a kid just being infinitely impressed by that oh god no because th- yeah that was like perfect time like when i was still like obsessed with animals and whatnot yeah and, like galapagos islands were like the coolest fucking place on earth to this make. movie is fucking perfect for kids yeah this you have to show both your kid both this movie and pirates of the caribbean you have to like we we're talking about like some of the stylistic differences and you know how maybe this is more directly a war movie than uh pirates of the caribbean but like 
this is just as accessible in a, in a different way. And it's presenting the same elements in a little bit of a different way, which is definitely something that I think Peter Weir and kind of the generation of Australian filmmakers that he belongs to uh, are very skilled at. Like he came out of making movies in the seventies is when he really started kicking um, alongside directors like Bruce Beresford or um, Ted Kotcheff. I can't remember that guy's the guy who directed wake and fright. And then also people like George Miller, you know, the same generation around of, of Australian filmmakers. And uh, I don't know, the Australian film industry from around that period is fascinating because they made a lot of very interesting genre movies, and yet they weren't really sure how they wanted to position themselves as a film business internationally, you know, um, where some of these Australian movies feel very like, like they have high art pretensions, but then they still rely on genre tropes. So it's an interesting mix-up, you know? Defeat. Ah, uh, yes. So uh, Paul Bet strikes. Paul Bettany is giving him the uh, the like married couple like you're doing the right thing speech. And this is where uh, Russell Crowe reveals that uh, they've surpassed their orders. <laughs> No, I don't think he reveals it yet. He says it right now. Ah, oh, okay. I thought it was. He says the next there's scene. nothing personal to the Call of Duty. And he goes like, because Paul Bettany is like, listen, these are your orders. Sometimes people die, and Paul Bettany's like, hey, when I lose someone to a disease, I have to remind myself that I didn't kill them. It was, you know, the disease that killed them. I tried my best to save them, you know. Uh, and uh, it's the same thing here. And he says, uh, you know, you're just following your orders. And Russell Crowe's like, I surpassed my orders a long time ago. It's a, it is a matter of pride. <laughs> Do you think, but again, the, the matter of pride, the thing that motivates this movie, I think the question for me watching it right now, I'm, I'm really focusing in on is like, that question of pride, does it come back to like the individual or is it like a point of national pride? <sighs> yes it's kind of like he is lucky like he's known as lucky jack he never tastes defeat so like yeah i love this them throwing the snowballs by the way continue sorry that could have just been a thing the crew people were doing um <laughs> <laughs> muscle cope being angry and method acting in the corner over there yeah as you were he apparently was method acting for a lot of the time yeah, so like the whole thing of segregating the crew and, uh, you know, the extras along alongside their rank was Russell Crowe's idea, apparently. <laughs> um, and it is like a very blowhard thing to suggest. But you know what, Max? It does lean into that mizzen scene aesthetic where it's like, hey, we're not going to try to create this with artifice. We're just going to do it and get it with a kind of documentary realism. Which is, again, uh, something that I think feeds in very well to the war genre. I mean, how many times in war movies, especially now is like a selling point, like the realism and stuff. With war films, a focus on realism and a type of docudrama approach is very important, I think, to the marketing and the appeal that these movies have to people. Not saying that's like why they appeal to me, but I think it's an interesting facet of the genre. And that's obviously something they, they put a lot of effort into in this movie. The details are impeccable. Oh, here's the fucking cake. The fucking jello pudding. <laughs> Excuse me, chef, make this in the shape of the Galapagos Islands. The what, sir? <laughs> <laughs> Did they know about the Galapagos Islands before? They must, well, they knew about them and they, they knew didn't that go. There, there was weird animals there. But well, like, yeah, well, this is before Darwin. So yeah. is this, is the idea that like this fictional character in the, in the, uh, he gets robbed of his opportunity to be Darwin, basically. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> that sucks. Uh, that's a fun fictional idea, though. If you, like, I like that they would have done that. That seems like something that's great from the books. Is like, yeah, he, this guy was like Darwin. <laughs> well, yeah, if you subject to the requirements of the service. Looking though. into O'Brien's history, like, it's pretty clear that Paul Bettany's character was kind of supposed to be his self insert or how he kind of saw himself because he was a sailor for the British during World War II mm -hmm. and then retired to be a naturalist and a doctor after the war 
and you could tell writing these books was kind of almost therapeutic for him in a way and just like worked out some of his conflicts between like soldier and enlightened man and the conflicts of that but i don't know it the movie it's weird because the movie makes it so like even if the naturalist seems like smarter and like he would be right in more situations, the movie goes out of its way to be like, eh, Russell Crowe seems to have a better idea of how like things go in the world. Actually, it's a back and forth. It's a back and forth. Do you know the interesting fun fact about the naturalist character in this, in the relationship to the, to the uh, book series where at the beginning they're like, they're talking about how did the Acheron get the jump on us? How did they know where we would be? So in the books, I believe the Stephen Maturin character is a spy. Hmm. Interesting twist, no? Yeah. And they have a line in that where they're like, oh, they have their spies and we have ours. And they don't bring it up. Not a single thing mentioned. And you, if you don't know it, then you don't know it and it doesn't change anything. But if you do know it, maybe it does change something. Maybe you do see a little bit of the spy and in Paul Bettany's performance. We do get that highlight, Max. What's something that's highlighted when they're in port off Brazil? The mail. That would be how they correspond, right? I didn't know that at all. I didn't get that from reading any of the, well, then again, I haven't read any of the books. So, But then again, why would he blow himself up? Yeah, are you sure about that or are you? No, he's he was a spy in the books. But again, I think it also just goes to the idea that when they made this movie, they were potentially open to making more. You know, that's why they gave it the subtitle, The Far Side of the World, uh, because they were interested in maybe making more of these movies and it just never happened. And I don't know if the other movies they might have made would have been good, but I definitely know that was an open door that got closed. And that that just sucks. I mean, it works better if, because even though this is called the far sides of the world and there was a eye at potentially making a franchise out of this, if it did super well, it made its money back, but it did not make enough money to spawn a franchise. Yeah. Um, if you're not sure it's going to be a franchise, it's easier to just have a neat and nice. These are two different types of competing men at the same time. Yeah. And have the, any antagonism, go with that but i i think it's interesting they left it open you know i i reckon if you've read the books there's lots of little goodies in here for you and here we've arrived at the glop goes this kind of inaugurates the sort of second half of the movie i think where i i feel like the movie's partitioned into three parts right you have the first part where they're chasing the acheron oh galapagos aquinas yep all this great nature footage very australian <laughs> this is where the movie really becomes a Peter Weir movie in my mind. Um, because we've now arrived at this sort of mystical land and uh, Peter Weir in his movies, I feel there, he has such a strong sense of the mystical and its attachment to Australia as a sort of colonial colonized land and the majesty of like Australia um, and, and inherent in the land and the people, you know, uh, his movies often, at least his Australian movies, often deal with like a colonial or post-colonial subtext. And uh, they're great at sort of playing with like a, a metaphysics of like going into nature as well. And uh, this is where, you know, that movie sort of shines. If the Stephen Martyrian character is kind of an avatar of the author in the novels, uh, perhaps he is also an avatar of Peter Weir in this movie where, you know, we arrive at this strange land on the far side of the world and there's animal life completely unlike anything we've ever seen. But there's also these... This is where the movie starts to become, I think, more mystical, too, where we're going to see more of the interesting intersecting patterns that, like, motivate the plot going forward uh, in terms of the animals, and we're going to see uh, the stuff that eventually helps them capture the Acheron at the end in the island. By the way, what other movies by Peter Weir have you seen? I've seen The Dead Poet Society, and I have seen uh, The Truman Show. So his, most of his American movies, yes. basically. Yeah, he he's had a very long, um, fascinating career where he made a lot of, 
I, my favorite movies of his are probably his Australian movies. And um, by the way, just talking about colonialism and everything, I think this movie is a far less sophisticated approach to colonialism than his earlier movies. Maybe someone could prove me wrong. Um, but his, if you like this movie and you kind of feel yourself a pull to wish like, oh, I wish this movie had like maybe more explicit thoughts on like the colonial project of what they're doing, watch Peter Weir's earlier movies because his, his movies really steer into that at the beginning of his career. Um, but he's also directed a lot of interesting things in the U.S. Um, Dead Poets Society, obviously notable movie. Truman Show, notable movie. But he's also made stuff like uh, Witness, Harrison Ford movie with the Amish people. Um, and he made uh, The Mosquito Coast, also kind of like this movie about a crazy patriarch. Oh, I love Paul Bettany's outfit here. He is the most fashionable person on the ship, to be fair. This is the only time we see fashion in any sense. His Galapagos, like, Met Gala <laughs> Tourism. outfit. Tourism. Yeah. I feel like this is another scene that people who are shipping the gay romance might zero in on. But regardless, I think it's fascinating for their relationships where they drop all pretense of authority or whatever, you know, start addressing each other by first name. I do think that's a big shift in this type of movie in general. Because you have that heightened sort of domestic soap opera-ish uh, drama happening on naval movies, um, when they do shift to a first-name basis, I think it's pretty significant. <sighs> Our two friends are fighting. He wants to be Darwin. I mean, for real, Max, we can talk about the horrors of like the colonial project, but can you imagine seeing like a place like the Galapagos Islands for the first time and being one of the first people of your culture to engage with this thing? No, I completely understand. Like, I'm on Paul Bettany's side at this point. Like, if the colonial He's gone all the way to the Galapagos Islands yeah. when he wasn't supposed to chase this guy out of Brazil. I wish the colonialists were just naturalists. Yeah. That would have been great. They would have just fucking left people alone then. <laughs> we're like, dude, look at this fucking turtle we found. Isn't this shit bonkers? They would have been like, these people have such a different society from us. Let's learn from them. Obviously, it wouldn't have been that good. But no. if, if Paul Bettany, if the Paul Bettany's of the world were in charge. It, it, I, I, I don't know about that. They might have been just like, oh, look at this under evolved species of people. That's Let's true. Let's put too. them in cages and introduce them to the king. Uh, and see there how they there react. would have been a shot of Paul Bettany doing phrenology and measuring someone's skull. Yeah. <laughs> This is why they don't have gunpowder. <laughs> Nothing to do with the fact that they've had no interaction with the Chinese in the past <laughs> thousand years. <laughs> Must be that they're under We developed gunpowder on our own. We didn't interact with the Chinese. We just had the largest trade deficit to them of any country <laughs> in the world. Because we didn't have anything they needed. China. Um, At us. <laughs> President Xi, will you talk to Winnie the, the Pooh. US? No. Uh, Governor Gavin Newsom has just opened up all the stores in uh, California. President Xi, when will you take care of this situation? When will you just sweep in? We're waiting. Come on now. Get on that. Come on. Make me, make me your governor of the U.S. I can do it. Put me in. Put me in, coach. No. He got a beetle from his friend. He got the beetle. I do love the line that the kid gives him where he's like, you might have wandered the entire island and not seen this. It's like, you know what? That is kind of a compelling way to make the argument. And he gets him off his ass, you know? He's, he's studying fish now. Low on food, have plenty of fucking cannonballs to just practice shooting. Oh, I thought you were going to say they were going to eat rocks. Yeah, eat cannonballs. Eat cannonballs. Delicious. Too busy having our chef making the fucking Galapagos Islands out of chocolate. <laughs> <laughs> Can't afford to feed y'all. I did. That was something that struck me as a kid, and something that strikes me now is kind of the class divisions that go a little bit uncommented upon in this movie. The idea of like, oh, they have the other soldiers just standing there while they eat and drink and laugh. That'd be like if there was just some silent person just standing here while we were recording and drinking. Yeah. <laughs> 
Wouldn't that be weird? <laughs> Miles, the intern over there. <laughs> Miles, <laughs> by the way, we're pretending you don't exist. I'm You're just, hypothetical right now. Just stands in the corner and gets us our drinks. And Miles, don't say anything. Edits You're not all allowed the to talk. And posts. <laughs> yeah. All of our stuff. Haven't fed him in weeks. <laughs> what a trooper. Hope that college credit's going to be good enough for you. <laughs> <laughs> good old Miles. If you want to be the next intern on the Spectator Film Podcast, send After your Miles message. gets his arm cut off from getting a splinter. We have to amputate. We have to euthanize him for his own good. <laughs> <laughs> That's part of his contract. You know what else I'm amazed by in this movie that I find interesting is like the boundlessness of the ship. They have so much wood on board the ship. They just created a target dummy. And it's like, how much wood do they have? I thought they lost like several masts already. Well, I think they repaired it. And I think the target dummy was like made from like the boards and shit that he saw in the water in order to find the like survivors of the whaler whaling ship. Uh, hmm. Cause we saw like the barrels and the planks of wood in there. And then they were in a small boat too. It's a, yeah, set that up and shoot it. Either way, I do find it fascinating how this movie really embraces the idea of like a modular space to the ship, where it's like the ship, the ship is just like a giant blank slate, and then it constructs itself almost like a stage, Max, like to the needs of the scene. Like we're constantly seeing them move doors around and recreating or taking down his cabin, depending on the scenes, you know. And it's like, wow, they could change everything about the inside of this ship depending on what they need in the given moment. It's just an, a really interesting detail in historical touch. How many captains do you think actually did that? <laughs> many. Max, if you were a captain on a ship and you didn't do that, what the fuck is wrong with you? You were an elite noble person who <laughs> inherited your role and was sitting in your quarters for the majority of thing and let other people just do that. Yeah, what a bastard. I have a feeling a lot of people were like that. We were talking about this earlier about how, like, you know, the culture produced by the U.S. empire is so not worth the empire, you know? And it's just like, this This is why we get all this to get, like, shitty Star Wars movies. It's like, this sucks. And if, he, if you're a captain of a ship oh, in, in 1805... Yeah, in specific, like, I brought up the fact that, like, the Hobbit movies are atrocious... <laughs> And they also permanently changed labor laws in New Zealand so actors can't properly unionize. And It's like, that's not fucking worth that. <laughs> we got the Hobbit movies out of that, guy. That's Thanks. bullshit. That's terrible. That is fucking terrible. If things are going to be terrible, I want something in return. And it's, it's got to nice be better cruel. than The Hobbit. And you know what? If you're going to have a terrible 1805 colonial empire, at the very least, you got to fucking lean off the, the, the masthead. You can't be sitting lazy in your quarters. That's terrible. Can we just say how good of a job they did in the casting of the uh, extras? I felt so bad for the woman who was only accredited as additional casting in this movie because she went through thousands of people and she had to reach out to them based on <laughs> the director's <laughs> like, I want somebody who looks dead inside. The woman? The woman who the was, one woman. Who was in charge of additional casting. Oh, her. Yeah. yeah. I'm sorry. I, I'll pull up her name. But um, the casting director. No, she was just in charge of the extras. Yeah, extras. Yeah. Um, where tall order. Yeah, she just went around to like apparently like bars and back alleys and like because it's like America. We need everyone to look Poland. like a fucking sailor. Yeah, yeah. Just find people who look dead in the eyes and are okay with coming out to Mexico to fucking be on a ship for probably over a month. And if you have an opportunity, knock out their teeth. Because <laughs> it'll just make it look better. But seriously, all the all the sailors in this are just like perfect. Like It's just like, yeah, sailor. Sailor, sailor, sailor. It's just great. Imagine how bad this boat smells, though, dude. Like, <laughs> Oh, it would smell terrible. That's something that we talk about during the uh, preview screening is like how many different moments in this movie where it's like, that kind of just looks like a lot of fun. But then it would be like, as long as I could dip my toe into this moment, travel back in time, do this, and then leave and get a shower, that would be great. But I would hate to live on this boat. That would be hell on earth. Like we were talking about the storm specifically and how amazing it would be to survive like a, you know, a horrifying 1805 like 
dreadful storm or something, <laughs> but how terrible it would be the next day when you just have all that salt on you. Oh, God. Ugh. This is the closest the movie gets to a mutiny. But don't worry. He does the right thing to <laughs> get everything back on track. Kills himself, you mean? Yeah, of course. Yeah. In a horrific scene again. That came out of fucking, like, left field. Oh, you didn't think it was... No, well, it's just, like, one of those things that, like, you don't think the movie's gonna commit to it. Like, it <laughs> yes. Doesn't, it doesn't feel like it belongs in this kind of movie. I guess you should feel more prepared after you've seen, like, a kid get their arm cut off. Well, yeah, that's the other thing in the movie that you're like, oh, ooh, you're, you're doing this. Okay. In the first 15 minutes? Yeah. Oh, wow. <laughs> We're cutting this kid's arm off? Okay. I guess it's better than them being shot in the head Well, like, like the other kid. At that same point in other types like of movies, it would be where Lucky Jack gives an inspirational speech to the this guy that like actually gives him the ability to just like be a commanding officer and whip these men into shape and be strict with them and earn their respect by being a man on the seas. Yeah. But instead he just fucking kills himself because he knows there's never gonna be any trust in the boat until he's gone. Well, I feel like in a movie like this, what would happen more um, especially in the classic Hollywood films that I that this movie reminds me of, is that the younger man would have to fulfill the role yeah. of the older one because the older one gets like shot or you know whatever, or they get deposed or captured or something. Bit, he yeah. gets bitten by a Frenchman and <laughs> <laughs> and is incapacitated because of the venom. <laughs> um, yeah, something like that, you know. Um, but like in this one, it, it, there's really no threat to to Russell Crowe's patriarchal authority. Even though in these naval type movies, I do think in that kind of Oedipal way with, you know, the ship herself being the uh, female third party here, you know, the the crew and the captain are kind of dueling uh, more acutely than like in an infantry type movie where you'll, you'll have questions of like, you know, subordinates challenging uh, their leaders, but like, it's not quite as specific as it is in here. And I think it's most specific in submarine movies to the point where I feel like in, in any submarine movie, I cannot think of an example where there isn't like a threat of mutiny happening, you know? In fact, I would say a lot of submarine movies, part of the danger comes from the fact that there is a mutiny, <laughs> you know, and that's part of the driving force of the movie. Especially over the last, I don't know, 40 years or so where submarine movies, you know, submarines become this like avatar of destruction where they suddenly have nuclear capabilities. And then oh, you he can mix the Jordan Peterson argument. What? <laughs> there are hierarchies even in nature. Uh, yes. Consider the lobster. <laughs> God damn it. Jordan Peterson. What a fucking loser. If you're in Canada and you're a professor you have to be so annoyed that Jordan Peterson has like tenure or whatever. Does he have tenure? Canadian listeners, let us know. Does Jordan Peterson have tenure? Well, he has a job, by the way. You have to be <laughs> was it horrifyingly annoyed. Was it revoked after he went on his fucking benzo? Was the beef diet what yeah. finally broke his tenure? <laughs> <laughs> what a goddamn loser. After his daughter started fucking a Stalinist, was that? Has he ever written about like... Is he such a failed academic that he writes about, like, alpha males? Uh, no, but I know the guy who, like, was it, the wrote the book The Game, I think. Okay. Uh, it's either The Game or Bang, one of those hookup artist books. <laughs> Anna Biller's husband. <laughs> Something like that. Uh, he's now, like, a celibate. What? And, like, takes that, like, alpha energy to being celibate and calls, like people who have sex like pro like filthy procreators and okay whatnot. so he's posting his l's online <laughs> he's just like i think that those kind of people like have a need to feel p holier than thou so once like it's just about yeah it's about feeling better than other people so once like the swag of being a pickup artist wore off you're just like actually i don't have sex now that's what all the cool kids are doing i wish i was like that. oh this is creepy as hell Oh, yeah, where the, I mean, okay, so what we're watching right now, the, the character who's been, the officer who is disliked by the crew, what's happening now is uh, because uh, the guy was whipped for disrespecting him, they're all pretending to, like, tip their invisible caps to him. 
as he walks by and they're and not stand saying up anything. directly behind him. Yeah. But it's clearly meant as a thing where he's completely not considered a human by them anymore. You show just a little bit of backbone and you're fine. Like you can, yeah, you can't have them all flogged, but who would you be on the ship, Max? Who would I be? Yeah. I'd be the kid who got his arm cut off. He's epic though. Exactly. Okay. <laughs> what do you want me to say? I'd be the monkey, Austin. That that's what I want you to say. I want you to say who I'd be the be? monkey. I don't know. I have no idea who You'd be, be Russell Crowe? No. Would I be Russell Crowe? <laughs> I'd be a worse version of Russell Crowe, where I would get people excited to do it, and then I would somehow fuck it up. Like, the movie would end 30 minutes in. It would be identical for the first 15 minutes, and then it would end. <laughs> would you be the the old guy with the sideburns? The... Oh, with the, uh, the, with the coin in his brain? No, the, the officer. The guy who's like, that's damn fine seamanship. The one who looks Gets like John. shot in the head? Yeah, the one who looks like John Adams, that guy. Yeah. I don't know. I don't know who I'd be. He's causing it. I got a coin in me brain. <laughs> <laughs> Either way, I can say that neither of us are cool enough to be this guy. We're not cool enough to be the guy with the coin in his brain. His wound healed remarkably. I'd be the fucking cook. That's who I'd be. Or you know what? I would be the the wannabe doctor, the second rate doctor who's like, I got to study the pictures first, and then I can take the bullet out of your stomach. <laughs> That's another moment where you're just like, oh, he's gonna pull the fucking bullet out of his own. That scene is so great. I can't wait until we get to that scene. But first, we have to go through the most depressing scene in the movie. <laughs> It is interesting that this is offered kind of as like the second act, like low point. Don't you think? Yeah. It's just a side character, really. I, I just find like getting back to those ideas of the stakes in this movie, the stakes are so much about like personal character interaction where the, the low point of the movie is just the fact that the crew has kind of lost momentum and motivation and the fact that this character is going to kill themselves. That's really it. There's no other low point. It's not like the, the boat is on the verge of sinking. Even though they've lost, like, wind. They've just been kind of They've lost the drifting. ship. They're, yeah. they're, it's super hot. They're just in the middle of nowhere with limited supplies. Yeah, they have no wind, so they can't really go anywhere. Um, everything is tranquil. It's just very stagnant. And uh, that's part of why they're like, oh, this guy's cursed. <laughs> you know, It's like a rhyme of the ancient mariner sort of thing. Oh, they shot the bird. Uh, this guy's cursed. An old Bible tale of one guy on the ship didn't believe in God and God destroyed the entire ship because of it. That's yeah. not Rhyme of the Ancient Mariner. No, but I'm saying that's the part of the Bible they're referring to. It's like also what the nickname he is. He has is based on. Oh, he's about to kill himself. Yeah. Oh. Hell of a way to kill yourself, by the way, jumping off a boat with a cannonball in your hands. Because you got to hold on to that the entire time. <laughs> Or at least until you get far enough that you'll drown before you... Re- no, Max, because your brain is going to shut off before you actually drown. And you'll let go. So I don't know if you could actually kill yourself that way. But it does create a horrifyingly traumatizing image for this young boy <laughs> to see. <laughs> That's the real goal. <laughs> I want to traumatize this kid that already lost their arm. No, and you just... Well, no, you need to get to a certain degree where you won't be able to resurface fast enough before you drown. So... Yeah. I guess my point is that you're going to pass out before you die, so... Yeah. Have I told you where I almost drowned? No. Back when I was getting my scuba license? Were you in your car? No. <laughs> this was one of the few Max-related thing tragedies that was not behind the wheel of my car. No, I, back when I was, I want to say 12 and 13, I was uh, in the process of getting my scuba license. So I had joined a club at school where we did a bunch of outdoor stuff. and oh, I You never told me that. Did scuba. We should do a special episode where you dive to the Titanic <laughs> for our Titanic episode. You call up James Cameron. In 2025. <laughs> James, we're doing a podcast. Do you want to come come down? Can you take me to the Titanic? <laughs> I know you have a wall around it down there. <laughs> but uh, 
Oh yeah, so basically the uh, instructor that day forgot to uh, fully examine all the equipment and when you're scuba diving you have something called a BCD which is a vest that you inflate with air to offset the weight of all the metal shit on you. Okay. And mine was not plugged in properly so I was just wearing <laughs> like 60 degree, like 60 pounds of <laughs> metal equipment with no counterweight to it. I just imagine you jumping in the water and so, yeah. just being like <laughs> So I just jump in the water <laughs> and the general rule is like you, you let go of the ladder, you let yourself fall for like 10 seconds and then you just swim back up. And I'm like me swimming back up. I'm like, wow, this is taking a lot longer <laughs> <laughs> and it feels like it should. And I finally get back to the top and I like am way farther away from the boat than I should be. And I'm just <laughs> like, oh no, nearly passed out and died. <laughs> I also almost passed out and died while scuba diving. Actually, now that you mentioned that, that's so weird. I was in Florida. Okay. I went to Hawaii when I was like seven or something on a vacation, way earlier than I was able to pre- appreciate it. It's like the one time my family's like, let's go on a vacation to Hawaii. And they fucked it up by making it way too early in my life. Um, where I almost got oh, swept scene. up in a jet stream. <laughs> this fucking insane. I'd be this guy. Oh, you'd be the guy shooting the bird? Yes, the man who, on a deck crowded to the brim with people, is brandishing a gun. And you know what's going to happen because they're cutting back and forth. But even when it happened, I remember the first time I saw that, I was like, oh, fuck. Ex- <laughs> execute that man immediately. The fact that, that like the other guy was the guy they thought was like cursed, and then the stupid-ass officer <laughs> shoots the doctor. <laughs> we are on the opposite side of Brazil, my friend. We cannot get another doctor. I mean... Unless you can speak the local languages and then plead with them to help us. Race to Australia. (laughs) (laughs) See if we threw any doctors in prison. (laughs) (laughs) But if a doctor's in prison, are they a good doctor? Yes. Oh. (laughs) They just insulted the monarchy or something. I feel like there's a joke in there about uh, death of Stalin. (laughs) All the doctors... (laughs) How do we feel about a bad doctor? Well, if we get him and Stalin recovers, we got a good doctor. <laughs> if he doesn't, then... Yeah. Then he won't know about it anyway. That's what this movie's missing. Steve Buscemi <laughs> arguing with them. This is the guy I would be. <laughs> Looking at butts in medical textbooks and getting <laughs> yeah. all sweaty. While drinking. Being like, I got to save this guy's life. I'm just going to reach into his chest like I'm Jesus and try to pull the bullet out. Operation. Just really can't touch the sides. I don't know what that means. Do you have any facts about iguanas for me? Oh my god. (laughs) He looks like he's gonna die. The makeup in this one scene is really great. I mean, it is clearly makeup, but yeah. I don't think so. I think it looks pretty seamless. He looks like he's fucking losing blood. It's not too conspicuous. She's the Frenchie. Yes, they've got they've got the Acheron. So it's the choice. Do you save your friend or kill the Frenchie? I mean, even strategically, you have to decide to save the doctor, right? I mean, what would you do? Well, because, yeah, you've, you've gone up against the ship twice and you got your ass handed to you It's a marathon. Times. Yeah. It's a marathon, not a sprint. And without your only good doctor on the board and also your moral compass. <laughs> not even only good doctor. It's like the other guy, you're fucked. Yeah. Without, you're just fucked. And no one can play music with you. <laughs> the soundtrack to the movie will end if you can't save him. And that's going to be bad because this, this movie has a great soundtrack. This is the dude, dude's rock wholesome moment. This is the nicest mo- Russell Crowe's character gets in the entire movie. Yeah, where Russell Crowe will never admit that he's just being nice. Uh, but he's they like, could have stopped anywhere, but no, we went all the way back to the Galapagos <laughs> yeah. so you can operate. <laughs> well, the thing is, like, even if he died, he would die in the Galapagos. Yeah. And that's a nice thing to do for your naturalist friend. 
because if they died, then you could bury them on like the most unique island, you know. Have their like body they would devoured love this. by iguanas. They would love that. I would love that, Max. Although they did say the iguanas are vegetarians, but we don't know. These could be special Galapagos cannibal, evil iguanas. It's a horror movie. Galapagos cannibal. <laughs> Directed by Eli Roth. Ugh. Can we just talk about how Eli Roth sucks? That was like... We can't because Jay from Red Letter Media summed it up perfectly. What'd he say? Where it's just like I used to think that I liked Eli Roth's movies because they seemed to have like an ironic air of just like, oh, this is so dumb to them. But... And they were aware of that, so that's what made them charming. But then every interview you see with Eli Roth, you're like, oh... Oh no, he's serious, and it just kind of takes away any like interesting ideas from his movies. He's just such an idiot. Yeah. I remember watching the end of Cabin Fever, and I'm like, <laughs> only an idiot would insist on this. If, if you've seen the end of Cabin Fever, you know what I'm talking about. There's a joke with the M bomb, the guy. <laughs> um, I guess I should explain it. <laughs> no, <laughs> don't don't bother. You don't need. But to. it's just so stupid. It is. I wouldn't recommend Gavin Fever to anybody. But that's his only... That and Hostel are the only vaguely compelling movies. Yeah. I would, I would say Hostel is interesting if you want to see another example of the torture porn genre outside another of Another post-9-11 movie. Yeah. Yeah. But that's really the only context in, when it, in which it's really interesting. Eli Roth... I think Eli Roth is actually better as an actor. I wish he did more stuff as an actor just playing like a fucking weirdo, you know? You know that? You know who was originally supposed to play the Bear Jew? Who? Adam Sandler. What? Yeah. Adam Sandler was not available for the filming of Inglorious Bastards, so Eli Roth got the part instead. I don't know how that would go. Adam Sandler can be fucking violent and insane. Have you seen Punch Drunk Love? Yes. Great movie. He's so violent and horrifying in that movie. No, he's very good at doing specific things in movies, and occasionally yeah. directors <laughs> find that. But. Yeah. Maybe he could have been the Bear Jew. I don't know. It definitely would have been more comedic because I wouldn't have been able to take it seriously. Yeah, it would have been a hurdle for people unless they really took a, a specific. Or, approach. but also, the, like that would also be a thing of like image rehabilitation for Adam Sandler. Which, Maybe well, fuck that. I don't need that. <laughs> I'm here for us all hating Adam. Sandler. He would have been Jack and doing Jack and Jill the next year or whatever. <laughs> yeah. Oh, by the way, we're talking during the most intense scene in the movie. Yeah, we're we're talking because <laughs> this is an incredibly uncomfortable scene in the movie. There's so. So if you haven't seen this movie, what's happening is, uh, like we said, Stephen Martyrin, Paul Bettany, the doctor, was shot by that idiot trying to shoot the bird. And uh, they do this kind of gruesome scene where he has to remove the bullet from himself because he's it's the not even just the bullet. Enough. The the real hard part is he has to get the part of his shirt that came in with the bullet. Yes. Because otherwise it will fester and yes. infect and he'll die. And then there's that horrible part where they have to lift up his rib to get it. They have to di- they have to dislocate his rib uh. with a fucking gigantic <laughs> metal hammer. Because that's medical tools back then. And they have a guy just holding a mirror so he can see what he's doing <laughs> while he does it with his own hands. It is amazing that such an outlandish thing actually oh, plays so a fucking cricket. <laughs> what if baseball was even more boring to watch? Oh, God. I do like the bats, though. A plus on the bats. For cricket? Yeah. I don't know. I Even if I don't know cricket, it looks like they're having a fun time. But uh, that's all sports, though. Sports is another thing of men just being men being friends and something that happens in war movies throw surprisingly throwing often. the toy going after the toy oh his expressions of like people care about me are so charming in this movie yeah you know what's interesting in this movie max now that we're looking at these drawings of the beatles and everything there's a lot of moments in this movie where you see like close-ups of text or um, sort of graphics, whether it's a map or something. There's a lot of like visual um, moments like that where it's like, we're going to show you a text, uh, a representation of something. And I find it very interesting. I feel like there's maybe something at play in this movie in like the variance and the difference between like the thing as represented on paper 
and the thing as it exists in real life. You know, I, I feel like this movie is playing with that. And I think it begins in the opening sequence where you get that title crawl at the beginning where this might be a weird comparison, but it kind of, it reminds me of the movie Harakiri uh, directed by Masaki Kobayashi. Um, one of the great samurai movies where there's very little action in it, but it's about a samurai that shows up at this place and is like, Hey, I'm going to commit, you know, Harakiri here ritual killing myself um, to retain my honor. And then it becomes this thing where it's like, or is he here to like freeload and try to get like revenge on us for some reason. Right. But the idea is that at the end of the day, it's recorded as just another statistic of a samurai that committed Harakiri, but it's this whole backstory, you know, Sorry, so, we're missing some great law dialogue. Name a shrub after me, something prickly and hard to eradicate. Yeah, that's a great line. I'm sorry. No, but that's the, the banter between them really does solidify them as just sort of like it's great. It's it's a wholesome relationship in this movie. The acting carries it. Yeah, yeah. But like that's. I'm sorry, I didn't want to interrupt your point. No, it's fine. I was just saying, making point that I think this movie plays a lot in the difference between like you know his history as representation via like historical record and then history as it happened in a way that reminds me a little bit of Harakiri. Can you tell that they didn't actually go to the Galapagos Islands? Because a lot of, like, some of this is obviously just cut to nature footage. They did shoot some stuff in the Galapagos Islands. Really? Some of yeah. it? Okay. Not all of it, but there some of it. Some of it you can tell just by, like, some of the film stock and whatnot that they cut to. I do wonder if you were filming in the... Because I don't... I wonder if this was shot in the... Like, the thing is, I don't know if it's, like... It looks like too obvious where they have the production value of all the animals just not giving a fuck while they're standing there. But that is the Galapagos, right? The animals, because we've always had this weird special relationship with the Galapagos Islands, animals have never really developed the same, like, well, yeah, they it's fear like, of humans. And also, it was like, it's like the dodo where it's like there are no natural land yeah. brace predators. So every animal there is just kind of chill and doesn't have many defensive mechanisms. Just like capybara. They're just like, what the fuck is this human doing? <laughs> so it's like, okay, it looks like it's just something composited in, but it might not be if they were actually shooting in the Galapagos because the animals might just be like, what fuck you? I'm, <laughs> I'm sitting here. I must find that bird. The flightless bird. This, again, we're diving into the mystical element that I think Peter Weir does so well. It's part of why his earlier movies are so interesting in terms of the, how they tackle colonialism. But again, this movie only partly discovers it. And I think this is where the movie gets its most like symbolic as well. He's chasing the cormorant that the officer was trying to shoot when he shot him. Right? So he's chasing the thing that put him in direct danger that he just survived. And then he's going to pick up the beetle, the same type of beetle that uh, he was gifted after. Yes. By the young boy. And then he's going to lower his hand and we get this very poetic, beautiful shot of him seeing the Acheron on the other side of the island. And no one has any idea the Acheron is there. He just saw it because he wandered over to this hill accidentally. It's kind of like poetry, Max. It rhymes. George Lucas, truly the master of cinema. In George Lucas's mouth, it's stupid as hell. But it's not necessarily wrong. It's just connecting different sort of symbolic and visual elements to make it richer, you know? Yeah, but in his context, it was making Yoda's blood green. <laughs> <laughs> that wasn't even his decision. Yes, it was. No, it was people... Did you see the behind-the-scenes stuff? People were like, what color should his blood be? And he's like, oh, green? <laughs> he didn't decide anything. It just was like, all right, this is what it is. I don't call that a decision, Max. I think that's just like him being like, I, uh, I don't know. <laughs> he was a puppet. Come on. <laughs> <laughs> is Jim Henson still alive? <laughs> Come on, ask him. Oh, fuck. I'm going to call Steven. See what he thinks. <laughs> it's the pile of iguanas. 
Yep, and he has to leave all his uh, discoveries behind. Again. Uh, he'll never get to be Darwin. Well, the fact of Darwin being Darwin proves in this movie that he never gets to be Darwin. Right? I know, but we don't know if this takes place in like an alternate. I think we know it takes place in our universe. I think you can assume that. I think that's part of why, you know, in some of the generic um, sort of slippiness of this movie, the slipperiness, you know, people might compare a lot of the elements to, in this to a Western. I think the p- general plot outline of like, okay, we're doing a chase like this, very much a Western plot line of like, we, we were chasing an outlaw, right? And that's what they're doing. They're chasing outlaws. They're chasing pirates, privateers. Um, however, there are some key differences as well. Uh, I, I think the biggest difference between the naval combat film and the Western is uh, the ocean itself, where I, I feel like the Western is, regardless of everything else, it doesn't have the element of the ocean, and it treats the land and setting around them as something that's kind of like open to the future, whereas the naval combat film, it's a little bit more abstract, where it's just like, they may as well be in space. You know, there's no settling the ocean. You know, it's just kind of like this natural disaster thing that's just waiting to happen and you have to come to terms with it. And then he has a brilliant idea. Ah, yes, they found the stick bug. The nautical phasmid, the idea he has. And it is Russell Crowe's idea. Max, we're almost at the end of the movie. We are, but also this goes back to what I was saying before, where natural science has to be put aside unless it has a direct military <laughs> application. Yes. And we, we engaged in just of enough sciencing to level up our science on the ship to <laughs> yes. where we can use stealth now. Even though I'm pretty sure disguising yourself as like an injured non-combatant ship has been a thing as long as naval warfare has been a thing. Oh, shut up. But no, he just It didn't occur to him until he saw until the stick, stick bugs. bugs. <laughs> until 18 whatever. Or whenever Napoleon was in, I don't know, I fucking know. But I guess the thing too is like, maybe there's a sense of like, uh, I, I don't know, aristocratic honor that would prevent people from doing that. We're not going to hide who we are. We're going to meet the enemy head on. Yeah, it's like when you used to line up in formation and sh- take turns shooting at each other. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> While the two generals are sharing tea together. Yeah. It's more of a thing to show off our new New Year's model of guns and uniforms than yeah. anything. But. Oh, that cannon's great, George. <laughs> oh, thank you. The stitching on your uniforms is truly impeccable, <laughs> Jacques. <laughs> I, that's another thing missing from this movie that a lot of more modern war movies will have is uh, that sort of confrontation with a higher authority. Really, none exists in this movie. The highest authority is Russell Crowe. And any sort of doubts about the validity of his authority or uh, the motivation of it is just something he feels internally. Even the mutiny is not something directed towards him. It's directed towards the uh, supposedly cursed yes. uh, midshipman. But I do... Are those tampons? Wow. Yes. That's exactly what they are. Fun fact about this, this uh, ship has an entirely uh, trans male cast. What? Yeah. Crazy. So the the tampons were a necessary part of filming. That would be, that that would be just an amazing gay rights movie of just like. (laughs) Of trans men being. No, just like. Doing this. No, like, yeah, it's an entire, (laughs) entire Navy movie, but like, they're all just trans men. It's never commented upon. It's not like. Yeah, this is why the ship. A movie is like, like that has to. Be, I think about that sometimes. It's like, why don't they just cast all trans people in a movie? Yeah, just do it. Just do it. Someone has to do it. There has to be some indie movie that's like that. And just see what happens. I'm sure it's going to be know, interesting. I was that uh, because the both the Mega Millions and the Powerball recently got close to a billion dollars. You see a lot of people buying lottery tickets, but honestly. If I like won a billion dollars, I'd set aside a hundred million just to make it <laughs> the most in-depth, entirely transcasted I would, that's historical all, yeah, that's scene what I would movie do. ever. Like James Cameron is making a stupid blue elf sequel. <laughs> and it's like, you fucking idiot. You've no idea what to do with your money. I don't even care if people like these movies. You fucking loser. <laughs> do something interesting. Fucking blue elf. <laughs> 
Yeah, it's not a blue elves aren't a fucking metaphor for trans people, you goddamn loser. I didn't know how we got on this, but I'm mad at James Cameron now. No, that's fine. <laughs> it's a movie about the ocean. We were bound to bring up the James Matrix Cameron is in. the only good movie about that's a metaphor, mainstream movie. That's a metaphor for being trans. Have you ever seen Bound? I have not. Oh, fuck yeah. We got to do Bound on the show. Listeners, if you haven't seen Bound, directed by the Wachowskis, uh, it was the movie they did before The Matrix. Uh, you got to check that out. It also stars uh, Joey Pants, our local hero. <laughs> he lives near us. In fact, my boss saw him once at a church or something and then commented on how old he looked. <laughs> and he was like, yep. I always love that story. It's one of the most awkward, like, star encounters. A, can you imagine being one of, like, the 40-something-year-old men on this ship who have, like, survived numerous wars before this, and this 10-year-old boy is given control of the ship while the captain's on the boarding party? If it was this particular boy, it depends on the boy, Max. I know, but st- and I, I know he's well liked among the crew, and that like he's lost an arm. He's yeah. he's suffered just as much as anybody. He's also ten. <laughs> like, I doubt his ability to maintain order amongst these sailors. I think the thing is, people like my assumption about this way of life, and and the way life went back then is that you know people took for granted certain things about the way society was organized and the way people behaved and. I think the idea is like they wouldn't assume for the kid to be a natural leader, but their idea was like, oh, this kid is the de facto leader and we have to take care of them. Yeah. You know? So it's not like, oh, we expect to look to to them for, you know, answers on literally everything, but it's like, well, we're going to support the kid, you know? Russell Brand's big, big speech. Russell Crowe. No, Russell Brand. Russell Brand. <laughs> that would be another great change you could make to this movie. Oh. <laughs> oh. All right. <laughs> Ew. I like Russell Brand. Why? He was charming way back in the day. I don't think I like any of his acting performances. I just kind of like him as a person. Well, he's dead now, so. <laughs> he kind of. He reinvented himself as like some crystal spiritual guru. So. What? Yeah. Okay, so he's dead. <laughs> I swear, it's after he stopped hanging out with Noel Fielding. And it's just it went downhill from there. Can't believe it. You're obsessed with Noel Fielding. Would you follow Noel Fielding uh, on a on a ship like this if Noel Fielding was the captain? I mean, sure, why not? I don't want to say I'm obsessed with him. I just generally like anything I've seen him in. Mighty Boosh is a quality television show. So you're show. obsessed with Noel Fielding? Yes, obviously. Yeah, okay. Hey... The H HM- surprise is on our side. Ha ha ha. Surprise is a great name for a ship. Burr, 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 burr. Also, the ship is named Surprise, and they didn't even think of this strategy before. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> we it's only literally... know t- we only prepared for two things when they attack our rudder and when we attack their rudder. Any other strategy is completely unheard of. Yeah. I was pointing out during our pre-screening that that's a wonderful sailor way of calling the doctor a gigantic bitch. What? <laughs> of bringing him his tea. It's like, oh, thank you. Three lumps There's of three sugar. There's three lumps of sugar in here. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That is funny. You ready to lose that other arm, kid? <laughs> He's just going to be the Black Knight at the end of this action scene. Oh, man. Oh, man, Max, they're in trouble. It's France. It'd be embarrassing to be captured by Frenchmen. I mean, France was a global superpower for quite a while. (laughs) The whole, like idea of the french being like weak-willed effeminate eh, artists who are too busy smoking and having sex while they sleep instead of working during the afternoon that's like a very post-world war ii mindset toward the french maybe post-napoleonic i don't know i don't know they fought harder in world war one than in world war ii <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> 
So I guess one of the other things I really we want... have to show our flag before we shoot them. Yes. Otherwise, it doesn't I love count. This shot. In in the special features on for this movie, when that great shot where they're doing the tracking shot and all the cannons poke their heads out of the ship, uh, they actually start referencing like Busby Berkeley musical numbers, and it's like, oh, it kind of is like a Busby Berkeley musical number, in a weird way. Really interesting. The last thing I wanted to mention, um, or one of the things I wanted to mention about this being sort of, again, a uh, sort of throwback to an older Hollywood movie, is how much this movie reminds me of a Howard Hawks movie. Howard okay. Hawks made a ton of movies that are all about, like, male camaraderie. Uh, whether And male camaraderie in a very specific sense. In, in the idea of, like, an, a group of extreme outsiders, whether it's uh, Haratiri or uh, Scarface, the Howard Hawks movie that we've done on the show, or something like The Crowd Roars, or any of his westerns. He he loves making movies about groups of male outsiders banding together as a community. Even the thing from another world, in a yeah. certain sense, is a group of male outsiders, and they're all defined by like their position in a group of like extreme circumstances. They're all like isolated as a community. And to me, that's part of why this feels like such a throwback, is because it really does capture that feeling of the Howard Hawks sense of community among these men in a really successful way. In a very, no. And it, 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 the entire movie feels authentic. Yeah. It's not, it doesn't come off as people trying to recreate the idea of how we see it now as these people acted. It does kind of feel like you're just being dropped in yeah. to another voyage of this crew that could have many other voyages which again is something that peter weir talked about in making the movie he said we were watching some of the special features before recording and he was talking about like you know i, I wouldn't want to make an origin story of this i would want to just drop us in well from what i understand like the first book is like we're such great friends and then like the rest of the book or they're forming their friendship yeah or the rest of the book's they're either forming their friendship or they're like reflecting back on their friendship and the rest of the books are like how they got there or continuing to develop that. But yeah, starting with book 10 is a very, <laughs> is a very strong choice. Yes. Yeah, so we're just going to dive right into the middle of this fucking thing. And I'm surprised it worked as well. As it did honestly. Yeah. And I'm sure there's going to be some hardcore massacre and commander fans. Oh no, John Adams, <laughs> but who will lose to Thomas Jefferson now? Um, <laughs> You did mention this was supposed to be an American ship before. Um, so who knows? <laughs> yes, John Adams was assassinated. <laughs> He's a traitor to America. Seriously, Thomas Jefferson is such a bitch. He really was. Yeah. Do you think Burr would have been a better president, though? I don't know. There's no such thing as a good American president. True, but like Burr, like 100% lost his mind after he. <laughs> <laughs> like, I don't know if you know this, Burr, like, completely went bonkers after he killed fucking Alexander Hamilton in that duel. Which is so useless. He, like, tried to invade Mexico and declare himself <laughs> emperor. Like, this is like Baron of Arizona, the Samuel Fuller movie. He just, like, he completely fucking lost it. <laughs> Because he realized that, like, by killing one of the founding fathers, he fucking destroyed his chance at any, like, meaningful thing in U.S. politics. So he's just like, ah, I'm in Mexico now. In some ways, you got to be having more fun when you're doing that, though. Because now you have no more ambitions, and you're like, what do, do I want to invade Mexico? <laughs> and then you can do it. Fail miserably. And hopefully they kill you. <laughs> Here's a great example of the type of action that I like working. Oh, that guy got shot by another kid on the French ship. Um, but this is the type of action we were talking about before, where it's like, again, constructed almost entirely through editing. Uh, and yet it, it really works because every shot is its own little vignette. And we go from like vignette to vignette in this action scene and it's constructed in this very specific way. And because they choose the right details to focus in on, the idea that, oh, these ships are too, are like attached and right next to each other. 
and they're boarding and fighting. And yet that doesn't mean the cannon stop shooting either. We've got to do is a little tiny scene where it's like, okay, we've got to shoot the cannon at their cannon before it blows up our ship. We've got to do this moment where the guy stops the, the flintlock thing from us uh, sparking the cannon and firing it at the ship yeah. with his hand, you know, all these little tiny vignettes and it just works perfectly. And despite the fact of it being so hectic, it actually allows you to really keep track of the action because it kind of well, and divides yeah. it into little and moments. And there's no like, oh, we need to get the French plans to take over England or something like that. Yeah. It's, no, it's as chaotic as boarding a fucking French ship would be. It's like, there's a lot of smoke. There's a lot of death. Nobody's exactly sure where everybody is. Yeah. But you know you're supposed to kill the other guy until they stop trying to kill you. Or you're dead. That's the thing. You see these little little vignette moments, and they're like little micro objectives. Yeah, that are all all involved in in what would happen if you were trying to take over a ship. We just talked over it, but there's another moment where someone pours a bucket of water on a cannon to keep it from sparking. You know? Yeah. So it's like, oh, all these little things. You're just paying attention. Oh, they release the whalers that have been captured prisoner, and they give them swords. You know, all these little things you've got to do if you want to successfully take over a ship because it's hard to do. And uh, it allows the mayhem of the rest of it to work because you're you feel like you're watching it and it's like, oh, they're making linear progress and I have an idea of what's going on. It's not just like pure chaos. If this was a Zack Snyder movie, it would just be people waving swords at each other and it would be just as hectic. But you wouldn't have an idea of a Slow progression motion shots. Yeah. You would have no idea of freak, like freak on a leash playing in the background. <laughs> I don't think that's Zack Snyder style. But he would make a, a choice that bad. <laughs> Freak on a leash uh, <laughs> covered by a cello and a violin. Feeling like a freak on a leash. Shut up. It would be great if this movie ended with Down with the Sickness. <laughs> you want every movie to end with Down with the Sickness? Not all of them. But sometimes you're just like, that would be perfect. <laughs> That'd be like the biggest kick in the balls in the history of cinema. Just ending this movie with, down with the sickness. <laughs> <laughs> An X like super like criterion esque release of Citizen Kane. Just, <laughs> it just adds like an now with like an extra minute of new footage unearthed. <laughs> it's just a credits remaster. Or like Casablanca. Yeah. This looks like the start of a beautiful friendship. Oh, wow. <laughs> frankly, my, frankly, my dear, I don't give a damn. <laughs> uh oh, he's about to get punked. So I want to share my embarrassing story when I when I first saw this as a kid. What I've told you this. What? But um, because of the fact that I was coming off the heels of watching the first Pirates of the Caribbean movie, which was very over the top, like spiritual aspects to it and like mysticism and ghost pirates and whatnot. And the fact that there was more subtle mysticism earlier on that led to a guy killing himself. When this guy gives him the sword, I thought that the captain, like I was young. So I was like, wait, so the captain was a ghost. <laughs> or something like that. You thought he was dead the whole time. Yeah, and like he came back for this battle to like give him one last challenge or something like that. I don't know. <laughs> but I was young and I didn't get it until I <laughs> those fucking Frenchmen with their ghost captain. When I rewatched it like a couple of years later and I was just like, "Oh, okay. There's no like direct mysticism in this movie." But I was a younger kid coming off of seeing Pirates of the Caribbean. I was expecting there to be ghosts in my sea movies. Oh, we're sad now. Yeah, because we're putting the needles through your nose. Oh, all all our friends have been shot. As one last test, they had to do that to make sure you really, really weren't sleeping. <sighs> and uh, they're pl they're bringing back the sa super sad music. Max, what would happen if I was shot? I wouldn't even bother putting the needle through your nose. You fucker! <laughs> <laughs> Just put you in put you in one of those. Absolute bastard. Throw you over and take over the podcast for myself. 
do nothing but reap with a genetic copper week after week. I would expect you to at least lose your arm. <laughs> In my defense. I love that sailor's face, by the way. Mm, yeah. Great sailor face. I hope that guy got an extra $10 onto whatever they were paying him. Oh, okay. Lip I thought you were going to say an Oscar. No. Probably not, but... No, because this movie lost any Oscar. Oh, I'm going to do it in Return of damn. the King. <laughs> and listen, I'm not shitting on Return of the King. Fucking phenomenal movie. But it is it is sad to see other very, very good movies not get any Oscar wins the same year as Return of the King. The Fellowship of the Rings is still the best one, Max. Mm-hmm, no. It still is. That one should have gotten the Oscars. Especially because what won Best Picture that year was the other Russell Crowe turd. A Beautiful Mind. Oh, that movie's a I shit. you were going to say Gladiator, and I was about to get really mad, but that was before that. No, that was the year before. 2001, that movie, A Beautiful Mind is just such a shit, stupid movie. That movie's so bad, I can't even describe <laughs> how terrible it is. It's just the, the worst, most middle-brow, like, limp-dick piece of shit you've ever seen. I don't even have that strong feelings on it. I thought it was just kind of like another whimsical Look how weird mentally ill people are. (laughs) (laughs) Isn't this weird? He's getting electrocuted. Electric shock therapy. Isn't this schmaltzy? I hate that movie. (laughs) That movie sucks ass. Abel Seaman. (laughs) Not John Allen. It's close to John Adams. The little boy died. <laughs> what are they going to say to their mom? He, at least he was promoted to lieutenant before he died. <laughs> what would you say to a mom if if their kid died in your care? Congratulations, you're now uh, entitled. You've to won a, to a, entitled to an officer's stipend. For- <laughs> Your child dying in this war. You send them an email. You probably have 11 more, so you're fine. That's true. Come on, wench. Get pumping those things out. We gotta get all those stipends. Come on. I need you to make me an arm. (laughs) (laughs) You will make me an arm out of a stick bug. I will become a bug boy. It'll be like the ending of a Resident Evil game. <laughs> I'll grow a tentacle out of my arm. That, w- that would be an ending if the French captain turned into a tentacle beast. The <laughs> this combines it. with the ending of like Pirates of the Caribbean 2. Comes the David Jones guy. You remember that? With the tentacles all over his face. The David Jones. Is that what Davey. it's called? Davy. David, David Jones' locker. David Jones? <laughs> Davy, I said Davy. No, you said David. I said Davy, you fucking loser. <laughs> David Jones's locker. Shut up. I'm trying to talk about this kid being a crab guy with like <laughs> tentacles coming out of his arm, and you're making stupid jokes. I'm yeah, <laughs> that's me. <laughs> oh god, we we were prepared for this movie to end ten minutes ago. <laughs> We're splashing around in open water here. Well, I just think the ending is great. And then once you're waiting for that to happen, it's just like, yep, it's sad. And now we're just taking time to like wrap up our, you know, loose ends. Well, like we said, like this movie takes its time and shows you the day to day process. And yeah, the narrative is pretty much over, but like we need to set up the details, promote this guy for being in the background effectively the entire movie. Yeah. Mr. Pullings. (laughs) You, however, shall take the Acheron and go to Valparaiso. You're a captain now. <laughs> and it's like this big moment where it's like, oh, you have your own command of your ship now. Of course, not for long, as we'll see. Yeah, but I don't understand what the danger here is. Like... Are you afraid that the the French captain being alive is gonna like he'll magically retake control of his ship? Like, well, they have other Frenchmen on the ship. They don't have like so many people that they can just magically crew two ships. I know that. Got to cut off the head of the snake, otherwise it's still alive. (laughs) 
What? That guy. Oh, they just gave him the shitty doctor. You could have the second rate doctor. Frenchmen are easier to patch up. <laughs> Besides, I've been really promising this guy will go hang out with the turtles on the Galapagos yes. Islands. And he might kill me if I do it. <laughs> I don't want to fuck with this guy. I saw him pull a bullet out of his own stomach. <laughs> yeah. He could stab me through the neck with, like, with his cello. <laughs> his cello skills are hot fire. I can't beat him. Oh, of course, they didn't think he was a doctor. They didn't think he would be the only doctor, right? That's the thing that tips it away, right? Of course, you know what the other interesting thing, Max, is? Is, uh... Oh, you you idiot. You shouldn't have said it. I love the ending. I love the ending. Um, but, Max, you know the other interesting thing about the French captain posing as the doctor? Is that, oh, he goes to, he goes to see the captain, and then he... It's like he's meeting his own doctor. You know what I mean? It's just another dualism in this movie, where he's like, oh, I go to the French ship. Their captain is posing as their doctor. And our doctor is the most important character to me on our ship. You know, it's like, again, it's just a little bit of that mysticism that gives this movie a little bit of extra spice and extra kick. You shouldn't have said it, you fuck. (laughs) Should have bit your tongue and won an award for studying iguanas. The bird's flightless. It's not going anywhere. Fantastic final line. Burner, burn, burner. It's just great. It's up there with lesser of two weevils. Yeah. <laughs> just like, okay, you get how these guys operate off each other. And like, it does feel like a friendship where they, they kind of hate each other, but they also kind of love how much they <laughs> yeah. hate each other. And this is one of the most romantic moments in the movie where we get their cello playing. Yeah. Um, over over the-, the, you know, the beat to quarters and the crewmen taking action again. Um, it's very romantic, this ending. But again, I think the ending also raises questions where it's like, the ending itself, the final moment, is very profound because it's like, it almost introduces this element where it's like they're they're like stuck in a time loop. <laughs> almost just like they're destined to just chase each other forever and nothing's going to happen. Just fucking strumming on that cello. Uh, and a perfect final shot. It is. I think we get to show off our big boat prop one last time. Look how fucking cool this looks, my dudes. Yeah, it's great. And you realize that this is just one of many adventures that the ship will sail on, and it's the only one you'll get to see because they never made any sequels to that. They may make another one at some point. No, but- Russell Crowe said that. I believe somebody asked him about it, and it's like, hey, you should have voted with your wallets when the movie came out. <laughs> Oh, because it didn't do well enough to... Well, not with these people. Yeah. They may make another one, but not with these people. Amazon will put uh, $2 billion Oh, into it'll it. be a TV show. Yeah. Oh, fuck that. God damn, I hate TV shows. But anyway, that has been Master and Commander. A hit. wonderful adventure movie. Fascinating movie. And an excellent uh, drama, period piece, and a uh, homoerotic adventure. So. <laughs> yes. Um... And uh, I think an interesting introduction to the sort of naval um, naval uh, warfare genre. There are many other movies we could have started with. However, this is an interesting one to sort of dip our toe in with. And, and hopefully we'll get another opportunity to mo- do more of them soon. As is the case with more Peter Weir movies. I'd love to do more of his movies. As long as we don't do the Truman Show, because... If the fucking conspiracy theorists bring up that movie one more fucking time, I'll kill myself. So. Yeah, we can skip that one. Yeah. <laughs> but you can listen to more episodes on spectatorfilmpodcast.com or anywhere you can find podcasts, specifically iTunes, Spotify, and Stitcher. We have an Instagram account and a Letterboxd account and a Twitter account. Let us know on any of those if you want to hear us talk about any movie in particular. Wenches, you can email me at austin at spectatorfilmpodcast.com. And wenches and whalers, uh, don't contact me. Get away from me. Fuck you. Well, that's your decision. (laughs) I respect it. So, yeah, that's all I've got to say. 